Thanks again for coming, everybody, to the uh, debut of Buzzed Belief. That's right. That's right. Let's hear it. All right. I'm going to round of applause. You can applaud uh, soon enough for the appropriate parties who put this all together. Uh, and right away, we're going uh, to start with a, a little video. Are you ready to show that, guys? Maybe. Attaboy. A couple of jokes, right? I'll be here all week. Uh, I do want to thank the entire team for putting this together. The Mythicist Milwaukee team has been nothing but fantastic, uh, right from the, the last person uh, on up to the founders, Sean and Fritz, for getting this ball rolling. And uh, we're really excited uh, for this debut effort. Leading up to the big one in October, Dr. Robert Price and Bart Irwin. We hope everybody comes out for that one. The Myth Geeks from around the world are waiting to see and uh, hear the answer. Did Jesus exist? or not. The actual historicity of Jesus will be debated in October at the headliner at Turner Hall Ballroom. Really, really excited about that. Uh, I guess I have to push play here. Is that right? The guys uh, worked really hard. This is a fun, fun musical uh, uh, video that uh, kind of introduces uh, uh, the debate series, a little bit of an advertisement that the guys put together. So check this out. Uh, and after it's done, Brian will start us off. So thanks again, everybody. Welcome to Buzz Belief. Oh no, not one of those crazy Jehovah's Witnesses again. Can I help you? Yes sir, do you have a moment to talk about our Lord and Savior? I'm sorry, I'm just not. Wait, what was that? His name is Richard Dawkins, very spartan, fairly tall. You don't sound like a witness. Oh no sir, not at all. I'm an atheist, my good sir, a skeptic of reality. Just like antimatter, my skills defy gravity. An atheist? How horrid! I'm a Christian, you heathen! Next time you come around her, you'll be gone faster than Eden! Please sir, give me a chance. I'm not a killer or a thief, but if you'd like to talk more, watch our series, Buzz Belief. Buzz Belief? I'm curious. Please, tell me more. It's a spirited debate series, your ears will not get sore. From listening to the speakers debate religion to its core. I am a religious man, so I surely cannot conceive of a talk with an atheist where you change what I believe. Don't you sweat, my new friend. The point is not to convert, simply to speak our minds, not to offend or even hurt. Well, I can take a look. Please come in and sit. What do you have to offer? I can talk, but just for a bit. Here, it's a pamphlet. I hope it's not a bother. It doesn't matter if you're a sinner or a holy church father. You will love our debate series. You will leave without grief. It's spirit and all, the debates of buzzed belief. I can't, I don't know, I'm questioning my faith The paralyzing agony of judgment at the gates They say you'll burn in the ninth circle of hell Where demons start to scratch and tear out eyes of those who fell Wait, calm down, how do you know what's to come? The Bible says all lies for those who hate the Holy One But wait, we don't hate anyone If you just let me explain I think we need a place of time to talk about this more A debate? The debate, buzz belief, where people come together for a knowledge-filled retreat. Jesus, God, and science, too. Come on in and share. We'll discuss it till the end. All right, I'll see you there. Great job, guys. Hi there. Would you like to hear the good news about our Lord and Savior? That is good stuff, absolutely. <laughs> Hello to a packed Shank Hall. My name is Brian Edward, and I'm definitely not the person you came to see tonight. However, um, I am a member of Mythicist Milwaukee, the group who organized this event. 
and I'm honored to play my part of being MC tonight. I'm not sure if Mythicist Milwaukee means anything to you, but let me try to explain what it means to me. If I was restricted to just a single word, I'd say community. Two years ago, I found myself in Milwaukee, which I really love for all of its Midwest coolness. It's a modern city, it has a lot to offer, but yet still has that small town feel to it. It's like a, a mellow Chicago with all, all the ridiculous traffic. But there was a catch. I didn't really have any local friends to enjoy it with. I'd always envisioned joining a meetup group, but I wasn't interested in cooking or knitting or canasta or ferret photography, <laughs> which I assure you is a real thing. I found it on meetup.com. <laughs> However, I was interested in history and fairness and questions about the meaning of life have always bugged me. I was really ripe for this kind of group, but the thing was, it didn't exist. What did happen was I lucked into a chance meeting with Sean Frasick and F Fritz Blandone. They're the founders of Mythicist Milwaukee. But back then, MM wasn't this. MM was a website and a Facebook page. I mean, their page was chock full of really good stuff, but mostly what I liked was their passion. I mean, these guys were fired up. They were always talking about ancient history and mythology. In short, I guess what I'm trying to say is these guys were my kind of nerds, except for they were cool and pretty fun to hang out with. You know, so I'm psyched to have a couple of local guys I can call friends. Before I know it, they're introducing me to a whole community here. It felt really good to be welcomed into a small but growing group of people. I mean, not long after, we decided to plan something big. We called it the Myth Information Conference, and here's our plan. Let's fly a bunch of scholars into Milwaukee, have a day-long convention, and throw a big party afterwards. Of course, it's really nice to draw upon our combined convention planning experience of zero hours. But who is going to attend? Is there a secular community in Milwaukee? And that's what we wanted to find out. As the months of meetings drew on, I noticed more and more people were attending the planning sessions. The team was growing, and in April of last year, over 100 people attended the first Myth Information Conference. And we followed that up with another one in September in 2005, again drawing over 100 people. So yes, there was a secular community in Milwaukee. Before I know it, the, the team's meeting six times a month. Each week on Sunday, the team produces a podcast, which Rob Moore and I host. And it's really a privilege to be able to talk to the scholars and the authors that I really only ever thought I'd interact with on YouTube, which is kind of one way. Um, in a, a few months back, we decided to have meetings every Tuesday night, every evening. Um, every other Tuesday evening is what I'm trying to say. Um, these function as like the socials. And, and it, they're interactive. They're um, a presenter from the team presents each week. They're really cool. If you haven't been to one, you're missing out because they're really, really cool. But all of this is great. But what I'm really excited about, and the reason why we're all here today, is our new project, Buzz Belief. I'd like to take credit for this idea, but I can't. This is the brainchild of Mario Quadracci. We met him after the first Smith Information Conference, and he conjured up this unique idea and the funding for this unique idea. And we hoped it would appeal not just to the secular community, but to the religious community as well. I love the concept. I always, I've always thought there's too much otherizing when folks talk about different communities. These guys are this, those guys are that. When asked, how many people in that group have you met, the offers often, the answer is often disappointing. Like, I don't know anyone, but I heard that somewhere. That's why the idea tonight is to have a debate, a discussion. We can agree, we can disagree, and most importantly, we can disagree sanely. I've long thought that the religious communities and the secular communities have more in common than they have opposed. And the key is to actually listen to what the other has to say. And that's why we're here tonight, to debate, to ask questions, learn, agree, disagree, and have a beverage or two, right? Um, we've got a building after party here to follow, um, right here at Chank Hall. So stick around afterwards and we can have more discussion, more agreement, more disagreement, and more beverages. Call it your educational St. Patty's Day party or call it Buzz Belief, the Spirited Debate Series. 
So thanks for coming. Please enjoy yourself. Please get involved in the discussion. Check out our tables with merchandise and um, consider an MM membership. But for now, let's move on to the main event. And I'm going to turn the mic over now to Mario Quadracci, who will introduce our speakers. Good evening. Wow. Packed house. We were not expecting this. And uh, in fact, I, I actually played a show here a couple weeks ago, and uh, this this settles it. I'm definitely not as big as Jesus. So, <laughs> <clears throat> so anyway, I'm really excited about tonight. Uh, as my wife would attest, um, YouTube has turned me into a debate junkie, and I, I I'm pretty sure I've uh, drained it of all of the all the good ones. So. To see this live here tonight is, is really exciting, really, really special. And uh, I've actually watched uh, both Justin and Richard debate uh, several times online. They are both fantastic. They are uh, uh, the top minds in their fields and both really good on their feet. So I, I think we're in for a real exchange tonight. Um, but before I introduce them, uh, I, I would just like to say that uh, the realization of this event really almost has me tempted to use words like providence and fate to describe the near-perfect synchronicity with which uh, this thing came together. Uh, but as a skeptic who would be sooner caught with crystals on his chakras than throwing around words, <laughs> implying supernatural causation uh, in public, let me just say that I feel extremely lucky to have met the Mythicist Milwaukee team. Uh, how we came together is equal parts boring story and forgotten details, so I'll spare you. Uh, but again, I do feel really lucky uh, to not only have developed partners in this endeavor, but uh, friends as well. Um, and so if you guys wouldn't mind standing up, all of you, it's probably most of you in the audience. The group keeps growing. Um, but if, if all the Mythicist Milwaukee people wouldn't mind standing up, Sean, Brian, Fritz, everybody, and uh, if we could give them a round of applause, they work their butts off for this. <clears throat> And uh, one more quick thanks to a person who uh, may not feel at all connected to this event, but is really its um, first cause, uh, excuse the pun. Uh, my friend and mentor, uh, who is as editor of Milwaukee Magazine, took a chance on running a very controversial opinion piece that I penned, uh, kind of outlining my, uh, my reasons for abandoning my own belief in, in the supernatural. Uh, Kurt Chandler, would you mind? Yes. Without his bravery in running that story, I would have never met the Mythicist Milwaukee guys, and we would all be doing something else tonight. Okay, so, uh, by the way, sorry about all the phone calls and the nasty letters and whatnot. <laughs> yeah, I did. I, was, I left the country, actually. Uh, at this moment, uh, many of our fellow citizens are so politically entrenched, so self-inoculated against views contrary to their own, uh, that it's caused serious division in our country, and I think it really threatens the future of our republic. But tonight, as we examine the historical evidence for the resurrection of Jesus, let's resist those all too common urges and proceed with honest inquiry, openness, civility, and of course, a spirited debate. So uh, here's to truth. Great. So let's introduce the speakers. Uh, here to defend the historical veracity of the resurrection, please welcome Dr. Justin Bass. Uh, Justin Bass has a PhD from Dallas Theological Seminary in New Testament Studies. Uh, his recent book is entitled The Battle for the Keys, Revelation 118 and Christ's Descent into the Underworld. That sounds pretty... Riveting. I should have brought copies. I you should have. Uh, he's received gave one to Richard. I gave one to Richard. Nice. Uh, he's received a master's of theology from uh, Dallas Theological Seminary and a business degree uh, in entrepreneurship from Southern Methodist University. Dr. Bass is currently the lead pastor of 1042 Church. Is that correct? 1042 Church in Frisco, Texas, and a professor of a professor at Dallas Christian College and Dallas Theological Seminary. Uh, when he's not working, he's reading, watching movies, usually Lord of the Rings, my kind of guy, and is spending time with his high school sweetheart, Allison Bass, and their two kids, Ariana and Christian. Again, welcome Dr. Justin Bass, please. 
<laughs> and I'm going to introduce Richard right oh, away, oh, sorry, too. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. And here to argue the proposition, <laughs> sorry. Uh, please welcome Dr. Uh, Richard Carrier to the stage. <laughs> Dr. Richard Carrier is a world-renowned author and speaker. As a professional historian, published philosopher, and prominent defender of the American free thought movement, Dr. Carrier has appeared across the US, Canada, and the UK in on American television and London radio, defending sound historical methods and the ethical worldview of secular naturalism. His books and articles have received international attention. With a PhD from Columbia University in ancient history, he specializes in the intellectual history of Greece and Rome, particularly ancient philosophy, religion, and science, with emphasis on the origins of Christianity and the use and progress of science under the Roman Empire. He is also a published expert in the modern philosophy of naturalism as a worldview. He is the author of On the, History, On the Historicity of Jesus, Proving History, Sense and Goodness Without God, Not the Impossible Faith, Why I'm Not a Christian, and Hitler, Homer, Bible, Christ. That's the best title ever. <laughs> <laughs> and a contributor to The Empty Tomb, The Christian Delusion, The End of Christianity, and Christianity is Not Great. Uh, <laughs> as well as copious work in history, philosophy, online, and in print. And he uh, hates Johnny Walker Blue Label. I'll just also add that uh, Miguel Connor of Aeon Byte Radio, he's interviewed numerous scholars. You can find him online. You can see all the work that he's done. He was one of the first individuals that we met uh, as Mythicist Milwaukee, uh, and he was also uh, the first to reach back, uh, reach out back to us and, and be friends with us. Uh, so we have a lot of trust in uh, Miguel Connor's work, uh, and we respect uh, his ability to be neutral in what he does because of all the different individuals uh, from competing beliefs and thoughts uh, that he has already interviewed on his radio show, Aeon Byte Radio. Again, uh, you can also uh, donate uh, to his podcast to make sure that it continues. He is out of the Chicago area, so thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, honored to be here. I'm really honored to be here. Thank you for welcoming me here. First time in Milwaukee, first time in Wisconsin. Even though this is a debate, I wanted to begin on a lighter note, a non-controversial note, Donald Trump. <laughs> Y'all heard of him, right? I'm sure you're voting for him? Well, Trump likes to say, the evangelicals, they love me. They absolutely love me. He regularly says this. <laughs> and since I'm speaking at an event put on by Mythicist Milwaukee, I just wanted you to know that I have friends that are Mythicists back in Dallas. And let me tell you, the Mythicists love me. They absolutely love me. Tall Mythicists, short Mythicists, well-educated Mythicists, even the poorly educated Mythicists, they love me. So I'm hoping you will love me too, and of course everyone else who's here. But <clears throat> I really do appreciate Mythicist Milwaukee. They've been incredible hosts, very gracious, inviting me here to participate in this debate with Dr. Richard Carrier. I want to also thank Richard as well for his desire to interact with this, the most important of topics in my view. We really have this great organization that I know some of you have heard of back in Dallas-Fort Worth. It's called the Bible and Beer Consortium, started by my good friend Ezra Boggs. In fact, he's watching on live stream. And I loved learning last night from Fritz and Sean that this event and the Buzz Belief series actually was inspired by the Bible and Beer Consortium that's back in DFW. In fact, they gave me a Buzz Belief glass. We had the same glass with Bible and beer on it. We had the same thing. <laughs> Y'all have shirts, though. You're beating us with that. Y'all have got shirts. 
Seems that no matter where you go, people like beer. It's a strange thing. The BBC puts on a number of debates as well every year, and we usually have a good proportion of the atheist community back in DFW attend these debates. And recently, a highly revered member of the atheist community who had been an atheist for about 15 years, and you can even go on YouTube and watch debates where he's debating a Christian, he actually came to Christ. And I had the honor of baptizing him at our church in Frisco. His story really is incredible, and he gives many reasons for why he converted. But he does emphasize something that I had said in one of the BBC debates that we did, in fact, just last year. So I wanted to say the same thing that I said there tonight, if that's all right. So if you really want to remain an atheist, I recommend putting fingers in your ears and going blah, 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 or something like that if you want to do that. But I basically, I didn't say anything profound. All I said was, I challenge the atheists in the room, and I'm, and I'm challenging those who are unbelievers here tonight, to not just dismiss Jesus as irrelevant to your lives just because you don't believe that he's the Son of God or risen from the dead or supernatural. There is a secular approach to Jesus. And I actually got this idea from Sam Harris when he was discussing uh, something with uh, Bill Maher on his show, and he actually made this point, and he brought up Jesus, he brought up Buddha as well, but he said, you know, maybe these guys... Maybe Jesus, you know, reached this extraordinary level of compassion. Maybe he was the Michael Jordan of, of compassion. And I think all of us here would like to be a Michael Jordan of compassion, unless, of course, you're a sociopath. <laughs> well, study the teachings of Jesus. Study his example. The Sermon on the Mount, the parable of the Good Samaritan, the command to love your enemies, and his own example of always reaching out to the outsiders even to the point of praying and forgiving those murdering him on the cross. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. It was teachings like these that inspired Tolstoy and Gandhi and Martin Luther King Jr. toward nonviolent revolutions and have transformed nations and countless hearts and minds. So my challenge is to take a very serious look, maybe another look, at Jesus of Nazareth. Because if there ever, if there ever was a perfect humanist, a Aaron Rodgers of compassion. Fr Fritz told me he's the Messiah around here, so, so I had to use that. If there ever was an Aaron Rodgers of compassion, it was him. Now to the debate topic. Are there reliable sources for the miraculous resurrection of Jesus? Yes. Yes, there are. I feel like the deck is stacked against me tonight, though, because I don't have to just defend a resurrection. I have to defend a miraculous resurrection, but I'm up for the challenge. I am up for the challenge. And just so you know how compelling the evidence really is for the resurrection, some non-Christians have believed that God raised Jesus from the dead. In fact, Pincus Lapid, right here, who taught at Hebrew University in Israel, argued in this book, The Resurrection of Jesus, A Jewish Perspective, that Jesus of Nazareth did indeed rise from the dead. He followed the evidence where it leads, yet he remained an Orthodox Jew. He didn't even convert to Christianity. He just wasn't convinced that this meant that Jesus was the Messiah. But he did say later that if, when the Messiah returns, if he ends up being Jesus, he'd be fine with that, which is nice. I think that's pretty rare, isn't it? Isn't it pretty rare for adherence to one religion to believe the central claim of another one's? Do any non-Mormons believe Joseph Smith was a true prophet? Do any non-Muslims accept the claim that Muhammad flew on a horse into heaven? Are there any non-Scientologists who believe there was an overlord named Xeno? Actually, do even Scientologists believe this? I don't even think Scientologists believe in Scientology, but that's for another talk. But there are non-Christians who accept the resurrection of Jesus, and I would say it's because he followed the evidence where it leads. So what are the reliable sources that account for Jesus' resurrection? Let me just first give a quote from the agnostic and soon to debate here, Bart Ehrman, in his most recent book, How Jesus Became God. This, he basically says right here what bare minimum I want to demonstrate tonight. He says, it is in theory possible even to say that Jesus was crucified and buried and then was seen alive bodily afterward. A historian could, in theory, argue this point without appealing to divine causality. That is, without saying that God raised Jesus from the dead. And by the way, Ehrman, this is exactly what he believes. He believes Jesus was crucified, that he was buried, that he, uh, all these people believed that he appeared to them bodily. 
but he doesn't believe Jesus really rose from the dead. And so bare minimum, that is what I want to argue tonight, those historical facts. I don't intend to prove that Jesus rose from the dead. In fact, I don't think it can be done with 100% certainty. But instead, I intend to show that certain historical facts, and I'll be arguing from five tonight, make a compelling case that he did. And we gain these facts from five reliable, independent sources from the first century. And here are the five facts. Jesus' death by crucifixion. Jesus' burial. Jesus' tomb was found empty on the third day. Jesus' appearances to multiple individuals and groups, believers and unbelievers. Unbelievers include Paul and James. The rise of a Jewish movement in Jerusalem, worshiping this crucified and risen Jesus as Messiah and Lord of the world. And I believe the best historical explanation for these five facts is not just the resurrection, but the miraculous resurrection of Jesus. And if you follow the evidence tonight where it leads, you'll come face to face with an empty tomb and with a risen Christ. Now let me lay out the five independent sources we have for Jesus' resurrection that all date from within two years after Jesus' death to about four to five decades after Jesus' death. Here are our five sources. The first is L. You may not be as familiar with that. Scholars put uh, L represents Luke, but it's specifically everything that's unique to Luke, things in Luke that are not found in Matthew, Mark, and John. That's what scholars call L. Sermons in Acts, even though Luke, the same author that wrote Luke, wrote Acts, scholars find pre-literary traditions in the sermons of Acts that's, that some, even Bart Ehrman argue, go back to within the first decade after Jesus' death. Paul's early let oh, I'm sorry, Mark, the first gospel, number three. Number four, Paul's early letters, which dates to about within two, two decades after Jesus' death. And then we have a very early creedal tradition from 1 Corinthians 15 that, as I said, goes back to within two years of Jesus' death. Let me be clear. These are the kind of sources that atheist scholars, agnostic scholars, Jewish scholars, Christian scholars from all different kinds, liberal, conservative, if, if you pick up just about any historical Jesus book, these are the kind of sources they're going to be working with. So let's start with L, Luke's unique material. It's virtually unanimous among scholars today that whoever wrote Luke also wrote Acts. Okay, It's kind of a sequel to Acts. I love movies. It's, a, it's our sequel in the New Testament. It's debated whether the author was actually Luke, this medical doctor travel companion with Paul. But whether it was Luke or not, I'm not actually arguing because it's irrelevant to my argument for the reliability. Whoever wrote Luke and Acts did claim to have interviewed eyewitnesses who knew Jesus from the very beginning and also became an eyewitness himself traveling with Paul towards the end, the latter half of the book of Acts. How do we know this? We know this because of these interesting we passages we passages in the book of Acts. They start abruptly in, at Acts chapter 16, and you, you, as you see, they're not everywhere. They're scattered throughout. And what many scholars argue is that the author, maybe Luke, we don't know for sure who the author was, but whoever the author was is saying, uh, he had been saying over and over again before this, they went here, they did this. And then out of the blue, he says, we went here. And so the author now has joined Paul on, the, on these journeys and where he's going, and so he's present with the same people that are in the account, and so he becomes an eyewitness at this point. And let me give you one, two examples of the we passages that are significant. So this is from Acts 21. It says, on the next day we left and came to Caesarea, and entering the house of Philip the Evangelist, who was one of the seven, we stayed with him. Now this man had four virgin daughters who were prophetesses. As we were staying there for some days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. Look at that. If he was really, if the author was there, he got to hang out with Philip the Evangelist, who was there at the very beginning of the book of Acts. He, he hangs out with prophet Agabus and these four daughters who are prophetesses. Now, this is the most fascinating one. And at, later in Acts 21, it says, After these days, we got ready and started on our way up to Jerusalem. Some of the disciples from Caesarea also came with us, taking us to Nason of Cyprus, a disciple of long standing with whom we were to lodge. After we arrived in Jerusalem, the brethren received us gladly. And the following day, Paul went in with us to James, the Lord's brother, and all the elders were present. Now, notice that we have Philip the Evangelist, Agabus, 
Nason, who Luke calls an ancient disciple, probably from the very beginning. We have James, the brother of Jesus. That's a pretty good guy to talk to if you want to know about Jesus' life. We have all the elders of Jerusalem. Who are these guys? Definitely people from the beginning, not to mention Paul. And if James is around, guess who's probably around James somewhere nearby? His mother. Mary's probably nearby as well. And so here we have a very reliable source because he had access to all these people if he is included in these we passages. Richard actually says this may be true. He says, if I can get it back. He says, and not the apostle faith, a chapter I actually thought was really, really well written. He says, maybe that does mean the narrator or his source was with Paul on those journeys. But we are not told this, nor told who the narrator was or what his relationship was to Paul. I, I get the skepticism, but I really don't think it's warranted here. Luke says we. He says we. What, I mean, what does Richard want him to say? Reader, by the way, this is me, Luke, when I say we. I mean, does he have to say that? I think we is sufficient. This is what he's saying. He talks at the beginning of the book how he interviewed eyewitnesses. Now he's given evidence that he did. He met with James. He met with uh, all these people that are mentioned in the we passages. So if the author was there for these we passages, then this is a very reliable source for not only the stories of Jesus, but also the unique testimonies that are given in the resurrection accounts in Luke. In Mark, according to the unanimous testimony of the early church, it's sourced in the Apostle Peter. Peter was kind of looking over Mark's shoulder as he was writing Mark. It's actually considered Peter's apostolic preaching in narrative form. That, that's what I think the best definition of this first gospel, the gospel of Mark, is. It's basically Peter's preaching in an extended uh, 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 written narrative form. And in case you didn't know, Peter is a pretty good eyewitness. Another great person to want, you want to talk to if you want to learn about the life of Jesus. He's at, you actually find Peter in just about every story of Jesus in the Gospels up until his denial. And after that, the women in Mark become his chief eyewitnesses to the burial of Jesus and the empty tomb on Easter morning. If Peter is behind Mark, then we have, again, a very reliable source in Mark's Gospel. When it comes to Paul, I love common ground. Richard and I are in complete agreement with Paul that he previously was a persecutor of the church, he was an enemy of the church, fighting against the church, and then something happened, we'll debate that, but there's something happened to Paul that changed him to become the apostle of Christ and him crucified. And what's Paul's explanation? He says, have I not seen the Lord Jesus? So here we have a direct first person eyewitness to the risen Jesus in Paul. And let, let me let that sink in. Not only do we agree on this, and everyone agrees on this, that he was an enemy, okay? This isn't just some believer, someone who followed Jesus. This is someone who was fighting against the faith, and he had this transformation. Everyone, Richard, everyone needs to explain what happened to Paul. How do you explain this transformation? In fact, Bart Ehrman makes this incredible claim, talking about Paul not only as a source for uh, saying that Jesus appeared to him, but also Paul knew James, the Lord's brother, and Peter. And he says, so in the letter to the Galatians, Paul states as clearly as possible that he knew Jesus' brother. <clears throat> Can we get any closer to an eyewitness report than this? Paul knows one of these brothers personally. It's hard to get much closer to the historical Jesus than that. Yes, I completely agree. Lastly, the creedal tradition that Paul quotes in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 8. It's truly incredible. Again, I think we have some common ground, at least on some of these facts I'm going to give about this creed. In fact, I just want you to know, I could, we could take away all the four other sources, only have this one source, this early creed in 1 Corinthians 15, and we would have everything we need for the foundation of Christianity. We would have Jesus' death, we would have his burial, his resurrection, and appearances to 513 plus eyewitnesses. And guess how early this creed dates? Again, it's vir virtually unanimous that it dates somewhere between two to five years after Jesus' death which is very early, very close to the event. Gert Ludemann, who's an atheist German scholar, says, we can assume that all the elements in the tradition are to be dated to the first two years after the crucifixion of Jesus. James Dunn, British scholar, one of the most uh, significant New Testament scholars of our generation, he says, this tradition, we can be entirely confident, was formulated as a tradition within, notice he doesn't even use years, he said within months, within months of Jesus' death. Here's the creed itself, in case you haven't seen it before. This is what, in particular, dates to within two years, maybe months, of Jesus' death. Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, and he was buried. 
and he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures. He appeared to Kephas, which is the Aramaic word for Peter. Then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom remain until now, but some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, and then to all the apostles. And last of all, he appeared to me also, as to one abnormally born. Like I said, if this is the only thing we had, if Richard was able to take away all the other sources, and God only in his wisdom gave us 1 Corinthians 15, we would still have the unalterable bedrock of the Christian faith. In fact, Robert Price is coming to debate. Did you know he finds this creed so incredible, so incredible that he actually just cuts the whole thing out of 1 Corinthians 15. He says that Christian scribes later added it. I agree with them that it is so incredible because he says it's like a creed. This had to have been written 100 years later than Jesus. And he just cuts the whole thing out. Some have called that a scholarship of convenience. You find something that's inconvenient, you just say, Christian scribes added it later. So these are the five sources that undergird the five historical facts that leads us to the resurrection. Follow the evidence where it leads, even if it leads to dangerous places. Now, before I close, let me just take a look at two of those facts a bit more closely. Jesus' appearances to these multiple individuals. So notice, these are all these different individuals, I think Richard would agree with most of them, that the, the majority of them we even get in that early text in 1 Corinthians 15. So this is men, women, this is unbelievers, believers, groups, individuals, multiple different people that claim Jesus appeared to them. And I really like what agnostic scholar Paula Friedrichsen said on this. She said, I know in their own terms what they saw was the raised Jesus. That's what they say, and then all the historical evidence we have afterwards attests to their conviction, conviction that that's what they saw. I'm not saying that they really did see the raised Jesus. I wasn't there. I don't know what they saw, but I do know that as a historian, they must have seen something. Yes, what did they see? I look forward to Richard's answer on what they saw. And then the last one, the rise of the Nazarenes, the rise of this Jewish movement, as I said, in Jerusalem, worshiping this crucified and risen Jesus as Messiah and Lord of the world. All sources. I mean, nobody debates this. Robert Price doesn't debate this. There was a rise of a Jewish movement claiming to follow this crucified and risen man, Jesus. Nobody debates that. But how does the historian account for the rise of this explosive movement within first century Judaism based on a crucified and risen Messiah that went on, of course, to overtake the Roman Empire and still has about a third of the, the world as adherents? What happened between Jesus' death and the rise of this explosive movement, especially if Jesus stayed dead? It's even more difficult to find out what happened if Jesus never existed. It's really difficult to start a movement when you're dead. It's even harder when you don't exist. Try it sometime. If you don't follow the evidence where it leads, you are left with a resurrection-sized hole in history. As Cambridge scholar C.F.D. Moule says, if the coming into existence of the Nazarenes, a phenomenon undeniably attested by the New Testament, rips a great hole in history, a hole the size and shape of the resurrection, what does the secular historian propose to stop it up with? That's a great question. What does Richard propose tonight to fill that resurrection-sized hole? I want you to listen carefully to what he's going to put in that hole besides the resurrection. Or as mathematician and scientist Blaise Pascal said back in the 17th century, the apostles were either deceived or deceivers if Jesus didn't really rise. Either supposition is difficult, for it's not possible to imagine that a man has risen from the dead. While Jesus was with them, he could sustain them. But afterwards, if he did not appear to them, who did make them act? Yes, who did make them act? What made them start proclaiming a crucified and risen Messiah, especially if he didn't exist? You know, I think Jesus has accomplished more than anyone who has never existed. Follow the evidence where it leads, if it le and even if it leads to your knees before the risen Savior saying, my Lord and my God. Thanks. I'm not going to touch it. Hello, everyone at Milwaukee. It's nice to be here again. All right, I'm going to jump around on various things as I go along. Um, but I do want to point out, I mean, despite some of the remarks in the beginning, in this particular debate, I, I am going to assume the historicity of Jesus for the sake of argument. Um, that way we can focus just on the resurrection claim. So the question is, 
if Jesus did exist, do we have the kind of evidence we need, reliable evidence, uh, that would convince us or should convince us that he rose from the dead? So we're not really going to be debating whether Jesus existed or not. Uh, let's just grant that for the sake of the argument. Uh, so the question simply is that. Do we have sources that we would consider reliable enough? Um, if we had this claim for any other deity in the ancient world, would Justin Bass be convinced by it? Uh, or any other similar religious claim, would he be convinced by it? I don't think so. So here's the problem with the evidence in general. We don't trust letters written by believers in any other religion that make claims to the supernatural. Uh, we have examples of this in pagan inscriptions where they report visions where gods appeared to them and said things to them and they say this is what the god said and so on. We don't believe those things actually happened. That's not a reliable source for saying that yes, a god actually appeared to that person and said those things. They either are pretending that that's what happened or it was a vision, some sort of hallucination, a dream, because they didn't really make a distinction between hallucinations and dreams in terms of communications from the gods. They believed a god spoke to them and said those things and appeared to them and so on. But we don't consider that reliable evidence that a god actually did appear to them and speak to them and so on. We don't trust the sacred myths written by believers in any other religion. We have other resurrected savior gods. We have Zalmoxis, we have Osiris, we have Romulus, we have Inanna. We have basically gospels or stories about them telling the story of how they lived and how they died and how they, uh, uh, their corpses were left and then they were resurrected from the dead and rose from the dead and went on. And then believers went on believing uh, this stuff. We don't believe these myths either. We, we know people made them up. So we know people make these myths up. Uh, so that's not what we consider a reliable source. We have no other sources for the resurrection of Jesus. A century after uh, the supposed event occurred, all we have are people hearing about the resurrection from Christians or from the Gospels, and the Christians are just getting it from the Gospels, or from the claims in the epistles, just the stuff that was listed so far. But the letters of Paul never say anything other than that Jesus was only seen risen in dreams or visions. These occurred, he says, only on isolated occasions to isolated individuals and only on one occasion in one mass ecstatic experience and only ever to fervent believers and in one unique case himself, still someone obsessed with Christians before he had this experience, not just some random person and so on. The letters never mention any body being confirmed missing by anyone. There's no empty tomb story or account or reference in Paul. He never mentions there being an empty tomb, never references anyone confirming the tomb was empty. They never mention a body being seen on any occasion ever, alive or dead. All they do is refer to, all Paul refers to are people having revelations of Jesus coming to them. The Gospels, meanwhile, I would argue, are full of wildly ridiculous stories uh, that we would reject in an instant were they the sacred books of any other religion. We can maybe debate that later on. But they are, in fact, the very worst sources we could have or ever have for any claim. Uh, they clearly fabricate tales without shame, I would argue that. They even change each other's stories without apology or explanation. None of their authors claims to be a witness of any kind to any of it. We don't even know who any of the gospel authors are, really. None claim to have even been alive at the time these events happened. None name any witness as a source for them, for their tales of empty tombs and resurrections. None ever mention having any source at all, much less a source who was a witness, except John, the Gospel of John, whose anonymous source is a fabulous person supposed, of supposed great fame, yet whose role in the story and even existence was never known to any prior gospel, and again, unnamed. They all contradict each other on what happened after the death of Jesus. They do not agree on what happened, where it happened, who saw it, or what they saw, or what they heard, or even whether they told anyone. None of what they say about that is corroborated in the letters of Paul, and they all have an obvious and explicit agenda to convince readers of what they say, yet give, uh, none of them give any reasons why we should believe anything they say. If we had these kinds of documents for any other religion, we wouldn't be convinced by them. We would say this is not what we consider reliable sources for these kinds of claims. Now, we should look at this the other way around. What evidence should we expect? What evidence would exist if Jesus really did rise from the dead? And I'm going to quote my chapter on the resurrection in the Loftus Anthology, The Christian Delusion. Only an ordinary explanation can easily explain why Jesus only appeared to diehard believers and then, much later, to only one of millions of outsiders across the entire planet. If God himself were really appearing to people and really was on a compassionate mission to reform and save the world, there is hardly any credible reason he would appear to only one persecutor rather than to all of them. But if Paul's experience was entirely natural and not at all divine, then we should expect such an event to be rare, possibly even unique. And lo and behold, 
That appears to be the case. Paul's conversion thus supports, in fact, the conclusion that Christianity originated from natural phenomena, actual human dreams, visionary, visionary experiences, and emotional experience that affected him uniquely, and not from any encounter with a walking corpse. A walking corpse, indeed a flying corpse, according to Luke 24 and Acts 1, 9 to 11, or a teleporting corpse, according to Luke 24 again and John 20, could have visited Pilate, Herod, the Sanhedrin, the masses of Jerusalem, the Roman legions, even the emperor and senate of Rome. He could even have flown to America, as the Mormons actually believe he did, and even China, preaching in all the temples and courts of Asia. In fact, being God, he could have appeared to everyone on earth. He could visit me right now, or you. He could appear on this stage. And yet, instead, besides his already fanatical followers, just one odd fellow ever saw him. If Jesus was a god and really wanted to save the world, he would have appeared and delivered his gospel personally to the whole world. He would not appear only to one small group of believers and one lone outsider in one tiny place just one time 2,000 years ago and then give up. But if Christianity originated as a natural movement inspired by ordinary hallucinations, real or pretended, then we would expect it to arise in only one small group, in one small place, at just one time, and especially where, as in antiquity, regular hallucinators were often respected as holy and their hallucinations believed to be divine communications. And that's exactly when and where Christianity began. The ordinary explanation thus predicts everything we see, whereas the extraordinary explanation predicts things we don't see at all. That's my quotation from that book. And I think that really tells us what we're dealing with here in terms of this, that we're dealing with a normal natural phenomenon of uh, a visionary religion, and there were many similar religions like that in antiquity. Now, if we were to compare this to, for example, the Roswell U UFO crash. Uh, now, we have tons of evidence around this. We don't have the kind of evidence for the resurrection of Jesus that we have for this. Uh, and yet, what happened was, the first new newspaper publications claiming there was a flying saucer crashed in Roswell, New Mexico, published in 1947. Three journalists, 33 years after that, were the first to record the flying saucer. A whole flying saucer was recovered. Alien bodies were recovered and autopsied by the government. They cited 90 eyewitnesses for this, who none of whom, as far as we know, recanted, even after government threats and persecution, supposedly. That's what we're told. This is actually better evidence for an actual flying saucer recovery and alien body autopsy uh, than we have for the resurrection of Jesus. The Mormon analogy, numerous eyewitnesses of the founding miracle, uh, both the angel Moroni and the golden plates. There were numerous actual eyewitnesses. We actually have their signatures. We actually have their statements. All were persecuted, none ever recanted. So these are far better sources than we have for the resurrection of Jesus, yet these claims are still false. And I think we need to keep that in mind, that this is the actual standard that we go by. Now, having said that, here are some other problems we need to consider. First, we have to establish that Jesus died. How do we know for sure that Jesus actually died, rather than was rescued, survived, or replaced with a look-alike or twin? These are all naturally possible things that can happen. You don't need a miracle to perform these things. Do we have the kind of sources we would trust to be sure of someone's death in the case of Jesus? No, we don't, actually. If this happened today, if, for example, David Koresh were claimed to have been seen alive again, and his body was missing, and no one had actually used scientific methods to confirm that he was dead, no one would believe he was really dead. Our first assumption would be that he escaped, he faked his death, or someone who looks just like him is pretending to be him. Those would be the obvious things. We'd have to rule those things out before we could confirm that David Koresh actually rose from the dead. And we don't have that kind of documentation for Jesus. We don't have the kind of reliability that we need to do that. Even if you can establish that he died for real, how do we know that the apostles actually believed Jesus appeared rather than only claimed it to establish their authority and re-motivate their movement? What if their goal was to create a moral reform of society to make society better and actually make the world better? What if they were doing this for a greater good, knowing that the only way to convince society to morally reform itself was to claim that Jesus had appeared to them? Do we have the kind of sources we would trust to be sure that the apostles were not just pulling another Joseph Smith? We don't. The main question after all of that, even if you can establish somehow that they're not pretending to have seen these things in order to achieve some other goal to start their movement, the main question is not just whether the apostles told the truth, but how do we know that the apostles meant by his appearing to them 
Why do we know what they meant by his appearing to them, even if they were telling the truth? Do we have any of this from any of them? No, we have no actual apostle, uh, none of their documentation, none of them telling us their story of what they saw. Not even in quotation through any kind of source that we can identify, except one, and that's Paul. And Paul actually says, he explicitly tells us Jesus only appeared in visions. Not only to himself, he says in Galatians 1 that Jesus appeared to him in a revelation, but even in Romans 16, verses 25 to 26, the only sources he mentions anyone having, he says the gospel is only known through revelations and from the scriptures, meaning the Old Testament scriptures. Meaning Paul did not know of any other evidence of the resurrection of Jesus besides revelation. Re revelation is how he believed Jesus appeared to the apostles. And there's no evidence throughout the uh, epistles of Paul that ever suggest anything else that the apostles disagreed with him on this. Even 1 Corinthians 15 verses 3 to 8 supports this with the singular momentary appearances. There's only one group ecstatic event mentioned there, and that implies, because he specifies that, it implies all the others were single individuals having single uh, separate experiences that were brief at came and went. This is not a, a body walking around. This is not a guy walking around visiting people, hanging out and having dinner with them. These are sudden flashing experiences that come and go and are hitting individual people on individual occasions. Except this one occasion where there was an ecstatic event where hundreds of the brethren were together and had this experience of Jesus. But it doesn't say what they experienced. It doesn't say what they saw. The closest thing we have in later records would be in Acts 2, where you have the ecstatic event of the, all the brethren together, over a hundred of them, seeing basically a light in the sky. This is very similar to uh, the kind of uh, sun phenomena and other miracles where people claim to see uh, the Virgin Mary in the sky. And hundreds of people can claim to see this. But in reality, they're all having a different kind of experience, a much simpler experience that they're interpreting a certain way. Since we don't have any account from Paul or any of these people what they actually saw, we can't say what they actually saw. We can't talk about whether it was an actual body of Jesus walking around or whether it was a light in the sky or some sort of ecstatic experience that they all felt the presence of Jesus. We don't know. Do we have any reliable sources that tell us anything different than that that was what was experienced by everyone? No. Not a single eyewitness tells us what they saw or what it was like other than Paul and what he says is not a res what we would call a genuine resurrection. It is a visionary experience, something that convinced him, but is something that we know throughout religions and religious history happens to people all the time. Nor do we have anyone who claims to have even spoken to an eyewitness. And that gets to some of the other points as well. When we talk about uh, the arguments of what kinds of things we have, did Paul or did Mark, for example, use Peter as his source? Mark never says that he did this. This was a later legend. It was uh, over 100 years later that this legend arose. There's no evidence in Mark uh, that he was actually using Peter as a source, or in fact any source. Mark does not cite any eyewitness source of any kind. All right. So we've got that, but let's go down the list of things. Uh, okay, so Dr. Bass mentioned L. Um, that is, by definition, simply stuff Luke added to the story. We have no evidence that he had a source for it. Uh, it just looks like stuff that Luke is making up and adding, because it's stuff that no one had ever heard of before, and he mentions no source for it. He gets to the sermons and acts. Uh, notably, speeches in antiquity were routinely made up, uh, fabricated. So we have no evidence that he has any sources for these speeches, and these aren't just things that he's writing down that he thinks would be the things that would have been said at this time. He doesn't mention sources for it. Even the idea that there are we passages in Acts, the, none of the we passages have a sermon in them. So even the we passages, whatever source is being used for them, is not the source for the sermons. So we can't support the sermons by using the we passages. But I have to point out that we passages are actually a feature that you can find often in fictional literature of the ancient world and in myths. Um, not only in particular in sea narratives, which we see in this case, the we passages are all tied to actual sea travels and travels around that area. But also we have another book called the Acts of John, and this is a ridiculous apocryphal book that has the, the uh, Apostle John doing things like commanding bedbugs to march like an army and all kinds of stuff like this, full of we passages. It's all about we did this, we did this, and so on. Obviously bogus. Anybody can say we did this. It doesn't mean that they actually are the people who were there. So that doesn't help us. We actually can't establish that Luke or even these we passages come from any actual person who was there. They don't identify themselves. They don't say who they are, how they know these things. 
And I would also point out that Acts lies about Paul's history. It actually puts him in Jerusalem uh, before he becomes a Christian, when Paul himself says no one in Jerusalem had ever seen him before his conversion, or even years after. Um, it actually tells the story of where he went after his conversion. It's exactly the opposite of what Paul tells us. Acts goes out of its way to actually make it seem like Peter and Paul got the idea of having a Torah-free gospel at the same time, and we're all in unison. That's not exactly, that's not the story Paul tells us. So there's many respects in which Acts tells us the, a different story. Um, and that's one reason why we don't trust Acts. Acts is clearly trying to make up things that it wants to sell the narrative that, it, that it's selling. We have no evidence that Acts has any other sources or anything like that. So we can't bolster the resurrection from the book of Acts. It's not what we consider a reliable source for that kind of claim. Um, and then we get to uh, the question of Mark uh, as a source. When we talk about Mark as a source, Mark actually specifically says that no one reported seeing the empty tomb. In fact, that's how his book ends. Uh, the only two people, or the only people who saw the empty tomb are these women that he names, uh, and then he says they told no one, and that's the end of his story. So actually, we don't have anything here in terms of this. This looks like a kind of fictional tale that he's actually telling something that relates to the message he wants to send, and that's not something where he's claiming these are his sources. This is a, so this is a story, this is a parable that he's telling. How much time do I have left? Five minutes, okay. Well, I've hit all of the points that were made that are relevant to be talked about. Uh, let's see. I'm going to talk about, and fill this because it might come up later, why did Christianity begin? Why, and, and it wasn't an explosive movement, by the way. Christianity was a really small fringe movement for 100 years. Even by the time of Pliny the Younger, this is 110 AD, this is you know, 90, 70, 80, 90 years after the religion began, Pliny the Younger was someone who was extremely well educated in the law. He'd served in courts in every major magistrate position in the Roman Empire. He knew the Roman Empire forwards and backwards, and he had never known anything about Christians. He'd never been present at a trial of them. He didn't know what they believed. He knew nothing about them. Um, that tells us that this movement was a tiny fringe movement even in the time of 110 AD, and that's a long time of evangelization. Uh, studies that have looked at the possible growth rate of Christianity, you look at the evidence, it seems to have grown no faster than any other religious movement that we know about. Uh, same growth rate as Mormonism, for example. So there's nothing explosive or extraordinary about this. This is just a novel, innovative religion, just like any other novel, re innovative religion uh, doing its thing. Historical contingencies are what led to its success, uh, like, for example, picking the right emperor in a civil war. When we look at that, we want to ask, though, why did the religion begin? Why did they start it? And the answer is when you look in the texts of Paul, this is our earliest source, it's clear that Christianity was fundamentally a movement of moral reform. Uh, it looks very similar to what was being evolving in the Dead Sea Scroll communities where they were uh, rejecting the corruption of the Jewish elite, the temple elite, and so on. Uh, they thought society had gotten sick and gone to hell, and they thought that society needed to be reformed. They had these ideas about how to reform society. I think Christianity fundamentally is a moral reform movement, and it makes it very similar to the cargo cult movements that we know about, uh, where they had similar origins, where they had visions that convinced them that they needed to radically change their religion and start a new uh, deviation of their religion, and they did that, and these cargo cults uh, grew up in the Pacific Islands in the early 20th century. We have many examples of that happening, and it's a similar kind of thing where they're stuck in a similar kind of political and social circumstance that seemed, there seems to be no way out of unless you can convince people to morally reform themselves in the way you think will make society better. And I think that's what Christians were originally motivated to do. Now that comes to the question, if you look at the cargo cults that did this, where you had original prophets, the equivalent of apostles, having visions and hearing spirit communications, telling them how to reform their religion and change their religion, start, it, start anew to handle and overcome the problems that they were facing in their society. Were they lying or did they actually have these experiences? Were they people prone to have hallucinatory experiences that were socialized within their community and therefore uh, someone that people trusted that these hallucinations were actually communications with the gods and not indications of mental illness, for example. Is that the case? Were they having genuine visions? Were they having genuine hear, uh, spirit voices in the sense for their perspective, even though they're, they're, it's their subconscious telling them these things to innovate, to create these solutions, but they believe they were actual gods and spirits telling them these things, and so they were motivated genuinely. 
Uh, if you were to, for example, threaten to kill them unless they change their, their belief, would they refuse to change their belief because they genuinely believe that these, these dreams and subconscious things that they're telling themselves were messages from spirits and gods outside? We don't know. Or were they actually pretending to have these experiences in order to change and transform their society so that if you threaten to kill them, and, and it, unless they recant, would they refuse to recant not because uh, they actually believed the things that they were saying, the, the, the visions or the real origins of their ideas, would they refuse because they actually are doing this to reform their society and they believe in the reform of their society is more important even than their own life and therefore they would stick to the lie even to their death knowing that that would actually achieve their goal of the reform of society. There are many religions that will do this, that will die for lies in this respect if they think it's a greater good. So that's the reality, that's the situation we're looking at. There's no evidence to contradict any of these things that I've been talking about as possible explanations. There's no evidence to undermine them. We have nothing except Paul saying people saw visions. That's it. Uh, that's not enough uh, to establish that there was an actual resurrection of Jesus. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Carrier. He talks fast like me, so try to keep up with all this. Before I review what um, I originally presented, I thought I would try to respond to a lot of the various things that 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 he brought up. You know, he he brought up one right at the beginning. You know, why doesn't Justin believe in Zalmoxis or Romulus? Well, I, I wonder. Has Dr. Carrier looked at the evidence for Romulus and Zalmoxis? I mean. Uh, Romulus supposedly lived in the mid-8th uh, century of Rome, and the first writings we have about Romulus are 1st century B.C.? I mean, that's about 700 years. I thought I presented evidence that's within two years of the event. So, uh, and Zelmoxus, uh, Herodotus is who tells us about Zelmoxus, and Herodotus is writing about 100 years before uh, Zelmoxus uh, supposedly Live so I don't I don't see the evidence I want some evidence you know give give me something to work with here give me a God that we have evidence that all these people hundreds of people multiple groups multiple individuals saw him and then went on to overtake the world give me evidence like that and then you know maybe I'll look at it I think that's something to look at but I don't know if Romulus and Zalmoxis meet that uh, high standard that Christianity leaves us with. He says the Gospels, none claim to be eyewitnesses. He then goes back and says exactly what I would say. No, John, and at the end of uh, the Gospel of John, we do have a direct claim that he saw these things, the one who wrote these things, the one whom Jesus loved. If I'm correct on the uh, Luke-Acts we passages, then we have an eyewitness of the latter half of uh, Acts 16 through 28. So we do have uh, eyewitnesses. And then if you trust the early church testimony, which is unanimous that Matthew and John were uh, sourced in those apostles, then you do have eyewitnesses as well. I love this argument, God should have done better, right? I mean, what, why did God only, why did God, uh, coming as Jesus, why did he only show up in this part of the world to only, and only appear to a few people? Why didn't he go to China? Why didn't he go to Pilate? You know, maybe, he, maybe Christianity would have done better if he had done that, right? Maybe it would have done, been more successful. Maybe it would have conquered more than just the Roman Empire. Maybe it would have been more than just a, a third of the planet and the largest religion today. Maybe it would have done better had they done that. I don't know. It seems like Christianity seems to be conquering the world in a way. We'll talk about a, uh, we could talk about a Pew Research uh, that came out recently that shows within uh, 2050, it's estimated that Christianity and Islam will be the most dominant religions in the world, about half of the world's population by 2050. So I, I don't know. I, it seems like Christianity, by any standard in comparison, any religion has done pretty amazing. I mean, it seems like it has overtaken. It's done like Gamaliel. If, uh, if this is of God, you're only going to find yourself fighting against God if you mess with this thing, because it's going gonna, it's gonna to go. It's going to make it. Um, he says, uh, let's see, and he says, you know, why didn't he appear? By the way, there's also a scripture in Acts 10.41 that specifically says, uh, God chose who would uh, Jesus appear to. He didn't appear to all the people, but he chose certain people for a specific purpose. Kind of, he wants to work through the weak to shame the strong. It seems to fit with the way God works. And so through these fishermen, they went on to overtake 
the world. And, and start talking about Paul, Paul did have other visions and things like that, but he makes it clear in 1 Corinthians 15, last of all, he appeared to me. That appearance was unique. In fact, in 2 Corinthians 12, probably one of the references that Dr. Harry is talking about, he says he has visions and he went up to the third heaven and things, but that's clearly not part of the last of all. That's something different than the appearance of Jesus. He looked at the appearance of Jesus in the same stream as what Peter saw, what James saw, and I would argue he believed it was a bodily resurrection, that Jesus actually appeared to him being a Pharisee. When he talked about resurrection, he was talking about physical bodily resurrection. Um, you know, the Roswell, he even said in the Roswell instance, we have 33 years later. I thought I presented two years after the event again. And, and you know what? If there are three billion people going around saying that they saw the alien at Roswell, you know, I'd go look too, and I, you know, maybe it is true. Maybe it is true. The Mormons, he said nobody recanted. Actually, six of the 11 witnesses of the golden plates, which aren't impressive, by the way. I'm not much impressed with golden plates. I'm far more impressed with the resurrection, even a miraculous resurrection. I'm not much impressed with golden plates, whatever they were under that sheet. But six of them left the faith. I mean, goodness gracious. If they saw something divine, you'd think they'd stick with it. You know, what, what evidence do we have of any Christians recanting of the apostles? Did Paul recant his faith? Did Peter recant? Did James, the brother of Jesus? Who recanted their faith? I'm not, again, I'm not impressed with the golden plates. We, I, don't know, I don't know how that religion even got going. But I argued in my opening statement, five sources and five facts. And I said, the, the resurrection of Jesus is the best explanation of those five facts. So let's just review a little bit. So his response to the we passages, he doesn't trust them. He says, you know, just because someone says we, you know, you can't trust it. Well, I would agree a little bit. But Luke chapter 1, in his prologue, Luke is clearly, and what I've seen, in, at least in uh, Dr. Carrier's writings, he agrees that Luke is writing in the vein of Greco-Roman historiography. And he says in the beginning that he interviewed well, he didn't say specifically interview, but he said, I followed and I uh, eyewitnesses from the very beginning. I checked these things out. And he used this word, akribos, a very specific word that we find in Polybius, that we find in Thucydides, that we find in Josephus, of the most respected historians of the ancient world. And he checked these things out. Well, how did he check them out? Well, the we passages come, come out of the blue in Acts 16 in various places. So, and, and many of the places aren't a sea voyage. That's the only example Dr. Carrier gives is a sea voyage example. That, you know, there's one sea voyage, but the majority of the wee passages are, have nothing to do with the sea voyage, so I don't know uh, if we can have the parallel there. But we also find, a very fascinating thing, Colin Hamer, who was a uh, Cambridge scholar on Acts, he lists, he, he argues that the wee passages are, are leg legitimate and that uh, the author, whether it was Luke or not, he doesn't nail down it was Luke, but whether Whoever it was, he was there. And one of the strong evidence he pushes for is that we have 84 facts that he lists that he shows where Luke got it right in those specific sections. So if you look at Acts 16 to 28, there, he has actually 84 facts listed that he just happens to get right on geography, on just titles, on a ton of things. So there's a lot of good reasons that we can trust that those wee passages are real. And he says the wee passages don't support any of the sermons. Paul is with him. Paul gives the longest sermon in Acts, in Acts chapter 13. That's the longest sermon. So I think Luke, if the, the author was with Paul, he had a good source for that sermon. As far as Mar uh, Peter be being behind Mark, like I said, many scholars, he didn't bring it up, but Papias is our earliest source, and he's someone that even comes from the end of the first century, and he's the earliest source that tells us that uh, Peter is behind Mark, and I don't see a good reason not to trust Papias. We also see within the, in, the internal evidence is fascinating. Peter is dominant. Other than Jesus, Peter is more dominant in Mark than anyone. He's mentioned first. He's one of the first few, few people mentioned. Uh, Jesus called when he was a fisherman, and he's also mentioned at the very end that Jesus is going to appear to him because the angel says to the women, go and tell your disciples and Peter that, that they will see him in Galilee. We also have these Aramaic phrases in Mark that, that aren't found in any, any of the other Gospels except the, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And you have all these eyewitness remembrances that you, ha you find in, in, in Mark. And so many scholars do argue that we have good reason, internal evidence, that Peter is behind. The best would be, sorry, Richard Balcom's <laughs> Jesus and the eyewitnesses. That would be the best place to look in, in uh, a very scholarly treatment of that. Uh, we agree on Paul's letters uh, that they're early. We agree on the same, that Paul wrote them, that they're early. He agrees with the, all the, the multiple individual and group 
uh, 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 groups who claim that they saw Jesus. He just says that's not enough. Well, I think it's not just that, but it's all these things. It's the explosive movement. It's the, it's the going on to overtake uh, the Roman Empire and going on to overtake the world. There's, it's not just some isolated thing and God gave up. It didn't look like God gave up, does it? We're having this debate. I mean, nobody's having a debate about Zeus existing, right? I mean, there's a reason why we're having this debate. Nobody's debating Romulus or Zalmoxus either. And let me just say that um, the rise of this Jewish movement on that point, this is incredible. I mean, he argued that they were going to start a moral reform movement. I, I don't know if he just came up with that tonight. I had not heard that before. But there were 14 other movements similar to the Christian movement at that time. And in every case, besides Christianity, when the leader died, the movement ended. Everybody just went and got jobs. It ended. Guess what happened with Christianity? For some reason, when their leader died, which he's now assuming is, is historical tonight, their leader died, it exploded. It still went on to overtake. What was different about this movement? Why did that happen? What was unique about Christianity. The effect is what is absolutely unique. And we have 14 other cases to compare it to. So this is very unparalleled. Why didn't any of the others want to have uh, reformation movements? Why didn't any of the others have hallucination experiences and things of that sort? I find the evidence very compelling. I find the 513 plus eyewitnesses. I find the rise of this Christian movement that went on to take, take the world. Many good reasons to trust that Jesus did die, he was buried, and he rose again on the third day. Thank you. And Dr. Carrier will have 10 minutes for a rebuttal, and then we'll go to the break. got to entertain you with um, an example of Papias, whom Dr. Bass thinks is a reliable source. Um, Papias supposedly said that Mark was uh, Peter's scribe, which is unlikely because, in fact, Peter was a Torah-observant Christian. Mark's gospel is actually against Torah-observant Christianity. It's, a, it's in favor of Pauline Christianity. So these are very different kinds of people. And, in fact, Matthew has much more Peter material in it than Mark. But Papias is not a reliable person. This is what Papias believed about Judas, because he believed whatever story anybody chanced to tell him, apparently. He says that, after, uh, that, that Judas, after his betrayal, his body bloated to such an extent that even where a wagon passes with ease, he was not able to pass. No, not even his bloated head by itself could do so. His eyelids, for example, swelled to such dimensions, they say, that neither he himself could see the light at all, nor could his eyes be detected even by a physician's instrument. So deep had they sunk below the surface. His genitals, too, grew bigger and more disgusting than all that is horrid, and to his shame out of them oozed pus and worms from all throughout his body whenever he relieved himself. After suffering an agony of pain and punishment, he finally went, as they say, to his own place. And owing to the stench, the ground has been deserted and uninhabited until now. In fact, even to the present day, no one can pass that place without holding one's, holding one's nose. So abundant was the discharge from his body, and so far over the ground, did it spread? Yeah, Christians weren't exactly the most reliable sources in the ancient world. So you can't rely on someone like Papias. And this is an example of the problem. People made stuff up, and Christians were gullible and believed it. Papias believed this ridiculous story. Someone made it up, and that's how this stuff happens. So you have to actually find a way. Can you look at a story and determine that it is, isn't one of these things, that it isn't a made-up story? How do you tell? That's the basis of a reliable source. How do you identify a source as actually reliable? We don't have any examples of that for the resurrection of Jesus. Now, that's the general point, uh, and that applies to everything that we're talking about. But let's go through the point by point and the other things. I'll just correct some dates. Uh, Zelmoxis uh, was supposedly lived 7th or 8th BC. Herodotus wrote in 5th BC, uh, 100, 100 or 200 years later. Um, but that's the moot point, is that someone made up this story and then uh, you know, spread it, and the religion grew, and that was the thing. There are many other examples of this, the Osiris story, the Romulus story. People were making up resurrected God stories all the time, and people were believing them. So how do we know Christianity isn't one of those cases? Um, I also want to correct the fact that the Gospel of John does not say he saw the things that he writes down. He says someone whom he doesn't name, he doesn't know their name evidently, uh, or at least the version of John that we have now claims this, um, 
had written something down, that he was using some sort of written source, some other written gospel, but he doesn't even name who that person is, and he just trusts what he says. He just assumes that he must actually be the person who was there because he wrote this thing. He gives us no actual testimony to identify that person as actually existing, and in fact, it's pretty good evidence in there that the authors of John made that source up. Um, I'm not gonna get into that here, but you can find the whole discussion of it in my section on John and on the historicity of Jesus. When we get to the we passages in Acts, again, none of those we passages have the sermons in them uh, that are relevant to identifying there being an empty tomb or that Jesus appeared in any sense other than in visions. And again, we have we passages in the Acts of John, another Christian text. Here's an example. Christians making up a text, another book of Acts, in which they're talking about we did this, we did that, and so on. They were making stuff up. Uh, how do we know that's not what's going on in the book of Acts or that wasn't going on in the source? Whatever source Acts used, the author of Acts used, he doesn't say. And we have no way to determine that that's what, uh, what happened or didn't happen. Um, and he, uh, Dr. Bass talks about why didn't God do it better as the issue. That's not the issue, actually. The issue is why didn't God give us reliable evidence? That's the question. Why not even a single eyewitness account? We don't have one. Why not? Why, not, uh, why did he give Mormons and Roswell UFO cults more evidence than he did for the resurrection of Jesus? And it's incorrect to say that six witnesses of Mormonism left the faith. In fact, what they did is they disliked the leadership of the church of, uh, of Joseph Smith and left on account of political reasons, not religious reasons. Um, I, and none of them ever recanted their testimony. It's important to mention that. Even after one or two of them stayed out of the church, they never recanted their testimony. Um, so again, we have more evidence for Mormonism than we have for the resurrection of Jesus. So. The other issue is the growth of Christianity afterwards. Dr. Bass makes a big deal of the fact that it became a triumphal world religion, but of course that was at the end of political and military force, right? Once it became actually the vehicle and arm of a fascistic government and under the Romans uh, that spread it all throughout the world uh, in that fashion, it wasn't by convincing evidence. It's not like they had great convincing evidence. They had no more evidence than we have now. <clears throat> also, uh, there appears to be some confusion regarding what Paul's talking about in 1 Corinthians 15. Paul says in Galatians 1 that no flesh and blood ever appeared to him, only in a revelation. Jesus only appeared to him in revelation, and it was that revelation that converted him. So this is clearly the vision that he's talking about in 1 Corinthians 15. It's the same one, and Paul never says there was any dis difference between how Jesus appeared to him and how he appeared to the other apostles. And in fact, in Romans 16, like I says, like I said, Paul says there's no other distinction. There's revelations and there's scripture and that's it. That's the only way you know about the resurrection of Jesus or the gospel or the teachings of Jesus. So uh, that's a problem, right? So when we're looking at that, we're talking about visionary cults, just like the cargo cults, just like the ghost dance movement, uh, just like the pagan religions that have uh, inscriptions testifying to them seeing the gods and, and hearing what they said and reporting them and so on. It's a phenomenon that occurs all over the world and throughout history. Uh, he mentioned, uh, Dr. Bass mentioned Luke in his prologue. Uh, I have a whole section on this in chapter 7 in Not the Impossible Faith that shows that Luke is actually mimicking history but doing it badly. In fact, in his prologue, he, he mentions using only written sources that he followed slavishly. He actually specifically says he followed them slavishly um, in the particular language of the time. He did not use eyewitness sources. He says he used written books that he said preserved what witnesses handed down over a period of time. Um, but that's, again, something he just believed. He gives us no reason to believe that that's true. Is he just doing what Papias did, just believe whatever story was told to him? Uh, would, you know, for, this, for the Judas case, for example? Uh, we don't know. This is not a reliable source. If someone just says, oh, I think this book that I'm using was handed on uh, through many eyewitnesses through time. I can't prove that to you, but I just believe it for some reason. That's not exactly what we call a reliable source. Um, all right. And then, is there anything else to mention? Well, not really anything that matters all of that much. Uh, so what was different about Christianity? Why did Christians come up with this idea of a resurrected savior and none of the other Messiah movements do so? Um, well, it's the same reason that innovation is unique. Uh, when you have the case of the Mormons, why didn't anybody else think of having one of the tribes of the Jews come to America? Why didn't anyone else think of having an angel come down and show them golden plates and tell them to marry multiple, multiple women? 
Uh, no, just Mormonism, Mormonism did this. You wouldn't say that because it's unique and broke away from mainstream culture, starting polygamy against mono monogamy, for example, uh, and, and changed other fundamental Christian doctrines, many fundamental Christian doctrines, you wouldn't say that, oh, they're the only ones who did it, and they did it, we have to explain that, therefore Moroni, Moroni must have actually appeared to uh, Joseph Smith. That's not uh, a sound argument. And there are many other aspects to that where uh, when we look at dying and rising savior cults, uh, dying and rising god savior cults, savior, resurrected savior gods, every national culture in the Roman Empire had one. Uh, the, Greek, the Egyptians had one. They had Osiris, for example. The Thracians had one. They had Zalmoxis, for example. The Jews, when, they, when someone in Judaism finally figured out a way to make a Jewish version of a resurrected savior cult, that was innovative, and they were the only ones to have done it. No one else did it, just like no one else did it in Egypt, no one else did it in Thrace, and so on. The fact that one group thought of this idea, finally, no one else did, is expected. It's what we see in all the other cultures. And that only one actually grew and thrived is, again, expected, because it's what we see in all other cultures. Um, there's only one other thing that's really a minor point. Uh, Dr. Bass mentions Aramaic passages in Mark. Um, none of those pertain to the resurrection of Jesus, so that's not actually per pertinent to the present argument. Um, how much time do I have? All right, I'll end there. Thank you. Uh, thanks to both participants for a great first half. It's starting us off right. One more round of applause. Thanks, guys. Fantastic. Take a quick 10-minute uh, break. We are a little bit behind schedule due to the technical difficulties. Please uh, enjoy a smoke, refresh your drink. Remember your yeah. wait staff here at Shank Hall and be back in a quick 10 minutes. Uh, when it really gets fun, Miguel will moderate uh, a head-to-head -head discussion for the uh, final portion of the program. Thanks again, everybody. The second half of our program tonight will feature a head-to-head -head discussion. A chance for the participants to address each other directly. Miguel Conner of Eon Byte Radio again will uh, act as moderator. And we look forward to uh, about a half an hour, maybe 40 minutes, depending on how it goes, of head to head discussion again between Justin Bass and Richard Carrier. Thank you all again for coming at 9 30 or so. Uh, after this portion, there will be a chance for some questions from the audience. <laughs> Uh, for a bit afterwards, and then, of course, uh, in the after party right here at Shank Hall, you will have an opportunity to mingle with everybody who's participated in this great event tonight. And uh, thanks again for every, uh, everybody for coming, participating. Make sure you take care of your staff and check out the merchandise afterwards. And without any further ado, Miguel Connor will lead us into uh, the second half of the debate. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Everybody hear me? Uh, yeah, and uh, please get your questions ready because your turn will come. I hope everybody's starting to get buzzed. But uh, we, m we might want to get back up here because obviously we have two historians here and they're sort of geeking out and having a good time. But I'm not a historian. I've never even stayed at a Holiday Inn. And <laughs> a lot of these folks, a lot of these folks aren't historians either. So maybe we should get down first to terminology. For example, the word is reliable. What exactly is a historian is reliable? For example, you seem to say, well, those in the faith cannot be reliable. But if that's the case, then there is no Muhammad because most of the writings came from Muslims. Uh, so is, is reliable an eyewitness, contemporary, or give us a definition of reliable. Why don't we start with Dr. Carrier and then uh, Dr. Bass can sort of uh, uh, join in. Yeah, um, obviously it varies from document to document and types of things. Uh, ideally, in history, you want converging lines of evidence. So in the case of Muhammad, for instance, um, and the, the debate over that issue hinges on whether uh, certain coins and letters and stuff written around the time refer to Muhammad or not. Uh, and if you have things like that, casual mentions of people that don't have any particular reason to be making the story up or aren't people that have had the visions and therefore are just repeating what their visions are, you need that. You need something like that. You need a third-party corroboration, or you need a, a, a really abundant quantity of eyewitness evidence, um, or you need a, a historian who actually tells you what his sources were and what his methods were, and you can tell from his description uh, or her description, as the case may be, um, that yeah, that's actually a pretty reliable method. You need to be able to tell the difference, for example, between uh, the Acts of John and any other story that someone claims uh, to have been traveling with a guy and did these things. Um, the Acts of John, for example, is an obviously fictional text. So uh, how do you tell the difference between that and, and any other, something that you would consider reliable? That's the definition of reliability, and that's the challenge that we're facing with here. Mm -hmm. 
I would agree most. I would say um, physical evidence would be the number one thing you want. You know, coins or you know inscriptions, um, things like that. Apart from that, you want multiple attestation. You want independent accounts. You want uh, you say reliable historian, but a historian can believe crazy things and still give you true knowledge from the ancient world. So, a, g a good example, paralleling to Pap Papias, he he did that, which I obviously think that Papias quote is hilarious and ridiculous, <laughs> and I don't think it's true. But to parallel it with Josephus, Josephus, we would all agree, is a reliable historian that gives us great knowledge of uh, first century. Um, Judaism, Galilee, the 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 eighty seventy war, and Josephus has you know, ridiculous things. I mean, he has this one story uh, where a, a rock hits a pregnant woman and her baby flies out, you know, a hundred feet. So, I mean, do we throw Josephus away because of that? No. Uh, Josephus believes weird things, but you know, we as historians, we we try to sift through and find well, what what can we trust from Josephus and what can we not trust? So, I think multiple attestation, independent accounts. Things like that are the you know the things we really want close to the event as close to the event as possible early. So. Yeah, and you need to avoid occasions where there's deep suspicion. Um, so if there's a case where the author has a definite motive to actually convince you of something, their their word is not going to be enough anymore. Um, and you have cases like Josephus is a good example where there are a number of scholars now who doubt his story of Masada, even though it's fundamental to the Israeli military today. Because um, they actually have soldiers go to Masada and swear to, you know, the, swear in at Masada, um, but historians actually are increasingly starting to doubt that story because Josie, it's, it sounds very suspicious. There is, it should be no way he knows what happened at Masada because they were all killed, um, and they all killed themselves supposedly. Uh, but he he says there were two women who escaped, and that's my those are my sources. But it just coincidentally, Gamala, the same thing happened. Two women escaped and just happened to tell me about the suicide story of what happened at Gamala. Um, when you start seeing suspicious stories like that, Josephus wants to tell these stories of heroism. Um, it, it looks suspicious. And then you say, okay, I don't trust this. I need more evidence than this. Um, and in general, historians are very suspicious of things that aren't mundane political history, like, like military movements, offices, things like that. When you're looking at narratives, there's an increasing amount of doubt, and you need much better kind of uh, accounts of things. Um, eyewitness accounts would be good, uh, but even those, we know people can make stuff up. So. Uh, so it is a challenge, and we have usually as historians we have to accept that there's a lot of stuff that we can't know about the ancient world. A lot of it might even be 50-50. Uh, some of it's worse than that. But uh, the reality is, is we we don't have the kind of knowledge of the things that happened in the ancient world that we have for even like 200 years ago, which are marvelously well documented with newspaper articles and government documents and so forth that are all accessible now. And one thing I'd add to that, I agree with that mostly. Uh, I would just add to that though that. It's good to remember, and I, I know <coughs> Dr. Perry agrees with this, that every author from the ancient world is biased in some sense. I mean, there's so in some way you're going to find suspicious things. So, for example, mm -hmm. how do we find the historical Socrates? I mean, we have Aristophanes, we have Xenophon, we have Plato, and and you know scholars will talk about how Plato clearly puts his views of the forms and different mm -hmm. things on Socrates' lips. Mm -hmm. Did Socrates really believe that? Probably not. But the dialectic method, Socrates definitely, I mean, that, that probably is sourced in a historical Socrates. But it's three devoted followers of Socrates that we're learning about yeah, Socrates from. So they're biased, but we learn great things about who Socrates was. That's a really good example, because that's a case where we have three eyewitnesses who actually knew him. We have their text. Contemporary, yeah. Um, yeah, well, I mean, they all knew him. I mean, uh, Aristophanes, Socrates sure. sat in the play that Aristophanes wrote about him. Um, and That's so we why can I brought up James, Peter, and yeah. Paul. <laughs> so we can, but we don't have that. We don't have that, right? We don't have the writings of James, Peter, and Paul. Well, we, we have, have Paul, but, but we have all Paul says is that it was revelations, right? Well, but so, Paul says he met with Peter. He hung out with Peter. Yeah, but all he what says. What did they talk about? Uh, the revelations they had. The revelations they had. Come yes, on. Yes, Romans 16. He, he uses the word hystereo in Galatians 1. He yeah. says to seek out historical information. What was that historical information? What, when he had the revelation, what it contained, and oh, so on. Come on. It was about yeah. the historical Jesus. He wanted to know everything about Jesus. He wanted to know what oh, it was well, like. What was, what was, what was yeah. it like to deny that's Jesus? A separate, what, he wanted to know all yeah, yeah, that's a separate question from the resurrection, though. So we're, that, if you're going to talk about they want to know about the life of Jesus. Oh, yeah, but we're talking sure. about just reliability. We're talking about what we know about Yeah, yeah, but we're figure. talking about the resurrection. So there's nothing in there that has Paul saying anything regarding uh, the he says resurrection. says saw the Lord. Yeah, yeah, but in the same sense that he did, right? In, revelation. Right, but yeah, now, yeah. yes, revelation, but bodily appearance, because it's last of all. 
Yeah, but he's saying that it appeared not in flesh and blood, but in a revelation, right? And so, and he says well, in, in I mean, Romans if, 16, it's all, it's revelations and scriptures are the only way people knew about if, this. Gentlemen, uh, maybe moving back, and then, <laughs> yeah. then we'll let you guys <laughs> yeah, yeah. have it again. No, very good. We don't want to get, um, let's get back very to good. terminology. What about the, for example, resurrection? I mean, we're mm -hmm. all just throwing around resurrection here right. and there, but even that term is really not agreed. And I don't know even know if historians, for example, even Paul, in antiquity, that wasn't. Yeah, really Paul consistent. believed that we resurrected in new bodies, but the Pharisees believe if you know I, I would come back like me, which kind of sucks. I don't want. <laughs> I like Paul's <laughs> resurrection better, but or for example, you could be resurrected as a, a spirit or a phantom. You know, the apostle saw Moses and Abraham. So, what do you mean by resurrection? He just, I guess, we would term miraculous, right? Yeah, I mean. Uh, I mean, I'll, I'll let Dr. Bass answer this in a moment because it, it does depend on what p proposition he's defending. But in terms of the terminology in the ancient world, resurrection usually did not mean just survival of the soul. It meant a transfer of the soul to a new body or to the restored old body. Um, and the words that were used did not distinguish between permanent resurrection and temporary resurrection. So the idea of, uh, there's a Christian apologetical distinction between resurrection and revivification. But that distinction did not exist in the ancient terminology. So uh, when you see people talking about the risen Jesus, you have to kind of infer exactly what they mean from other things they say. Just the words themselves don't really tell you what they mean. Um, but I do believe, and Paul's pretty clear on this in 1 Corinthians 15, that the belief was that Jesus' soul had been transferred to a superior body and he now resides in that body, right? Um, so the question is, is, how did they come to that belief? What convinced them of that? And, and Paul says it was a revelation that convinced him of that. And you might have more to add on that. And disagreement. Yeah, um, <laughs> sure. Yeah. So, so yes, I, I believe that uh, the Jewish understanding of resurrection uh, would be different. I, I agree that there's other, you, you could even use the word resurrection in some of those cases, but the Jewish nature of resurrection is, I think, unique. Bodily resurrection, again, in a new world, the kingdom of God. And I, I would say Daniel chapter 12 is very specific to this. Those who are in the dust of the earth will rise, some to everlasting shame, some to, to shine like the stars. The Maccabees, I think, give us a great example of what I think Paul believed in resurrection. So in 2 Maccabees chapter 7, you have these uh, Maccabean martyrs, each of them dying for their faith. And one of them, it's a, it's a great uh, text, he reaches forth his arms and he says, cut off my arms because uh, God will give me them back at the resurrection. And so that's the kind of resurrection I think Paul believed in, and that's clearly the resurrection that Luke believed in. I mean, Jesus received his arms back. You know, he received his legs back. He had this, the nail marks. So I think that's, uh, that kind of resurrection, I would argue, is unique to the Jews, and that's, a, that's not what the other um, pagan religions and things believed in. Um, well, what do well, they believe in? That's actually like not, that's not the case. Uh, that kind of resurrection was present yes. among the pagans. Um, I mean, it's, it's the kind of resurrection that Osiris is explicitly described to receive in the pyramid texts, for example. In he Nana, rises again in the, end of the underworld. No, uh, it depends on which story you're talking about. So there's the one where his bodies are assembled and then he rises from his grave. There's that version of it, which is in the pyramid texts. Um, we have Inanna, for example, her actual physical body uh, is restored <coughs> to life. The one that is killed and hung up is restored to life. Um, doesn't matter where it happens, but the belief was that this was the actual body she had. This is restored. different than, than Jewish resurrection. The, the key person, that's why I brought it, the key person, and he agrees, is the key text for this, is Metinger, the riddle of the resurrection. And he spends the last, he actually argues for dying and rising gods pre-Christian, mm -hmm. but he spends the last three pages discussing how Jesus' resurrection is absolutely unique in the history of religions. Absolutely unique. And he is the definitive scholar on this. So I, I think I'm but that's, in good company. In those pages, he's, he's not talking about this distinction that we're talking about now. We're talking about whether the pagans believed in the restoration of your previous body. Well, they believed it in a sense, but I'm saying the, the, the idea that, that, G, that Jewish and Christian idea about Jesus, that's what's absolutely unique. Yeah, but this is the problem we have, for example. You have Paul says that the resurrection body is going to be superior, it's going to be invincible, undamageable, um, uh, and all of these things. So that's what you the expect idea, from a resurrection body. Exactly, but this is a body that would not have nail holes in it, right? This is a body that would not have injuries or wounds in it. And so when no, we get I, to the no, description in the, in the Gospel of John, for example, we have a situation where that is not the kind of body Paul would imagine. Paul probably imagined what we have in some of the other Jewish texts, even N.T. Wright would agree, that some versions of resurrection involved a, a sort of illuminated body, essentially. Do you a think radiant. Paul believed in a, in a bodily resurrection of all believers at the end of the world? 
Oh, for sure, yeah. yeah. Uh, and he they believed, would get their bodies he, back? And he believed that that had happened to Jesus and that that was right. actually the beginning of the general resurrection. Okay. Yeah, yeah, for so, sure. And he, and he grounds that later uh, general resurrection in the resurrection of Jesus. And that final resurrection will be bodily. And yeah, they'll yeah, get their bodies back. Right, so exactly. Jesus got his body. That is what he believed. Yeah, absolutely, okay. that's what he believed. Right. And it's the question is, what made him that's believe that? Saying. And he says it was a revelation of Jesus that caused him to believe that that had well, occurred. That, but that's irrelevant to what we're talking about right now. We're talking about whether or not it was a bodily Oh, yeah, yeah. And I agree, I agree. I just don't think okay. that's unique to Judaism. And there were Jews that had different views on that as well. So but historians in, in Christianity, basically don't agree on the... What is yeah. resurrect? I mean, beyond... <laughs> yeah. No, the, the <laughs> reality is there, there were diverse but, Jewish sects back then, and there were diverse yeah. pagan views, so there's no one answer to this question. Yeah. Um, but what does matter to the debate is what, what Dr. Bass is talking about, is what did Paul believe, and that, yes. that, I think, represents what the first Christians believed, and that's what's relevant to and this debate. So much and hinges I, on Paul. I mean, it's... Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and I think Mettinger makes the point that this, what the Christians were claiming about Jesus was unique in the history of religion. I think it's very, that's a very important point to make. Yeah, it's this worth, is absolutely unique. It's worth reading those pages, anyone who wants to see, to see what Medinger is actually talking about. Let's read about. them. I'll, I'll read them out Read three pages. That's a lot of pages. Well, I could, read, <laughs> I could read just the, the section. I mean, I, I think I have it. Hold on. You keep asking, but I'll, I'll, I have the... But key. I mean, is it the part that explains what he thinks is unique about it? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I, I think I have that right here. Okay, so, and for the crowd, outside of the Bible, we have no first century... No. Uh, recordings of Jesus, of seeing yeah. Jesus resurrected. No. So no, it's, no, no. It, it's all within the yeah. Bible. Well, there's made up stories, but other but, than but, that, but it's important. Apocrypha in the first century? Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, well, second, not first, second, you're right. First century, century, there's not. It's yeah. second century and beyond. Mm -hmm. but it's so far as we know, anyway. But it's important to remember that the Bible is, you know, a bunch of different books. You know, if you, if you don't take it as the Word of God in just one book, right, it's, it's a bunch of individual books. So someone like Bart Ehrman is going to look at the, the Bible, the New Testament, and he's going to sift out what he thinks. He thinks the whole thing is unreliable, but he's still going to sift out sources that he thinks are reliable to tell him this about Jesus, this about the empty tomb, or this about this. So, um, so just because it's within the Bible, I want to make, make that clear, that doesn't mean you throw the whole thing out. I mean, these are historical sources for just like the, the, the biased authors of uh, talking about Socrates. We learned a lot about Socrates from these biased yeah. Except none right. of them are eyewitnesses. That's the difference. Uh, Paul's, Paul's not an eyewitness? <laughs> but again, Paul only says res revelation. And he doesn't James talk about anything else. <laughs> yeah, but all he says is revelation. He doesn't, he doesn't talk about any other experience of meeting Jesus. He doesn't say anyone meets Jesus any other way. Even in Romans 16, the only thing he mentions that people had was revelation. So, so, you, so you think if Jesus appeared to people, it wouldn't be a revelation? You think there's you a mean way an for, actual physical, like, like if like he actually Jesus, rose from the yeah, dead? if he actually rose from the dead, I mean, wouldn't it, no matter well, what, it would be a revelation? It wouldn't matter. It's still, because if it's, if it's a revelation, then but, you don't know if it's that or not. That's the question. You can't tell. But, but I think you can because I just argued it. Because Paul believes in a general resurrection that's bodily. He grounds it in the resurrection Yeah, but of if you have a hallucination so or a dream that says Jesus now has risen in a body. But and he that's didn't have it in a dream. There's nothing about him having okay, a dream. That, that might be another yeah. more of the terminology. That's true, yeah. Revelation, uh, apocalypse in Greek. Is that mm. what you, yeah, you're revelation. talking about? Apocalypse. And a revelation is when a god actually... Appears before you or within Something you. supernatural. It's, it's, it's within. I mean, so it's usually, supernatural. Yeah. Well, it has both, actually. We have, we have pagans who say that gods appeared to them in person in, in front of them and told them things. We have, we have actual eyewitness examples of this in, in the record. Um, and, but there's also people who, who, that God comes to them in their dream and tells them things, and they believe that's a real communication, and they also call that a revelation. Mm -hmm. So Paul doesn't distinguish, so we don't know what he's talking about. Um, but we can take it as hallucination if you want, like waking hallucination. Many pagan gods or, or pagan uh, worshippers of gods had these experiences. Um, we have many other examples, like cargo cults are an example of that. The ghost dance movement is an example of that. So uh, we, ha we have that. We know that's a thing. So the question is, we have now to determine if someone says they, uh, God appeared to them in Revelation and says, now I've, res I've been resurrected and the general resurrection has begun, the end is nigh. Um, mm -hmm. How do you tell the difference between that being a hallucination and that being a genuine actual appearance of a God? Um, we don't have the kind of records we need to tell that distinction to tell those two apart. Okay. We can keep talking about that, but I, I, I <laughs> disagree. Let me quote Met Mettinger. Mm -hmm. okay, go ahead quote. and then I'll ask another question. So he says, there is, as far as I'm aware, no prima facie... Um, evidence that the death and resurrection of Jesus is a mythological construct drawing on the myths and rites of the dying and rising gods of the surrounding world. While studied with profit against the background of Jewish resurrection belief, the faith in the death and resurrection of Jesus retains its unique character in the history of religions. The riddle remains. That's how he what, ends the book. What are the unique character? Well, he, the, the three would be, it was a historical event, crucifixion, and empty tomb, other gods died and rose not in history or on the earth. Dying and rising gods were related to the seasonal cycle. Jesus' death and resurrection was a one-time event. Jesus dies for the sins of, <coughs> the sins of his people. Uh, no other example involves paying for sins. Uh, well, that's 
It depends on how you do it, because that's the Jewish angle of it. The Osiris cult had a similar thing where your sins weighed you down, and you would actually go to hell if you were weighed on the scales of Mayat. If you went through the death and resurrection of Osiris through baptism, which symbolized the death and resurrection of, of Osiris, and you would share in his death and resurrection, those sins would be erased so that you would not weigh the scales and you would actually go to heaven. So that's a similar kind of concept. And we have this also in the Bacchic mystery cults, where people were cleansed of their sins through baptism, uh, and you could even be baptized for the dead, someone who died before they'd gone through the correct baptism ritual. You could, you could baptize yourself on their behalf. Um, and we see in Paul, he's talking about the same thing, baptism for the dead in 1 Corinthians 15. So it's a very similar cultic idea of baptism for the dead to cleanse people. And what's sins. our primary source for Osiris again? For Osiris? Uh, well, that would, for the, the whole discussion of the ritual, would be Apuleius, um, but we have examples from earlier of his resurrection story. Uh, but we're talking about the baptism aspect of it. Yeah. Um, Post-Christian. Right, but the Bacchic Baptist stuff, we have an inscriptions that are pre-Christian, actual stone inscriptions that are pre-Christian. So we know that for a fact. That, and says, dying, that says dying for sins? Uh, no, no, that says you can be cleansed of sins through baptism, right? And so uh, the concepts are all there. It's not really that particular. So Mettinger, you know, you either agree with Mettinger yeah, well, that, that particular angle of it is incorrect. But there's also, you have Romulus and Zelmoxus are also examples of historical. They're placed in history. Their resurrections are one-time events no, and no, occur in Romulus historical time. Romulus doesn't resurrect. He disappears. He ex he's exalted to heaven. There's nothing about resurrection. Well, yeah, he, his body disappears, and he appears in a body to uh, Proculus on the road. Never, does he use the word resurrection? Does he use anastasis or any of that? Oh, I can't remember if he does, no, but it doesn't, it, it doesn't, doesn't matter. It. You, you, if, you, if you die and you appear bodily again, you're resurrected. You have a new well, it body. It doesn't say he died. It just says he vanished. I, it does say it's, he, it's like he Elijah. Was, yeah, no, the story was that he was cut apart. No, there's many stories. Apart. Come on. Yeah, you, yeah. Go to, you know the text. I mean, it talks yeah. about like 10 different, the guy's like, I got 10 different stories on uh, Romulus. Let me go through the list. Yeah, yeah, but that's <laughs> the whole point is that, uh, that the idea was that Romulus died. That's actually, no, the, no, because that's, Plutarch has a whole thing about why so he thinks mixing, it's ridiculous. You, what, what I see you doing, and, and I'm not saying you're you know, doing it to deceive, but I'm just saying you, you seem to, you, you take a bunch of different stories and you try to make them sound as Christian as possible. When I actually go to the stories, it doesn't seem that way at all. Yeah, I, but I don't do that in particular. That's why I wish we would all, go all to the I'm primary talking sources. About is that Romulus is believed to, see this. All it was Romulus is believed to have died, and that was the thing. And then he was believed to have returned again. We don't have to talk yeah. about Romulus. Uh, <laughs> we are, we've talked yeah. enough Let's about, talk about Romulus. Let's talk about Jesus. Yeah, I think of Romulus, think of <laughs> sucking the wolf off or whatever he's doing. <laughs> <laughs> Oh yeah, that kind of gets me excited. But um, that story actually is pretty extra. Yeah, we don't, we don't want to talk about yeah. that story. Uh, but there's, um, chil there's children yeah. in the room. I've seen children in this room. <laughs> Twofold question, and it's going to be a different question for each of you. Mm -hmm. um, Doctor Carrier, what do you do? You see any good arguments for the historicity of Jesus? Something you wake up in the middle of the night like, oh my God, <laughs> this might. For, and I'm, I'm not trying to be. For example, Robert Price always says he like he if he was going to be convinced, he'd go with the uh, James Calvin theory that there was a mm. very strong church close to the time of Jesus with James, who, very Jewish, very close, who believed in Jesus, and he thinks that mm. might. Is there any argument that you say okay? Nothing that keeps me up at night. Um, <laughs> the uh, but that, I, I want to emphasize that that's a question about historicity, which is different from the question of the resurrection. So if, right. we, if we grant that Jesus existed, then we can talk about whether we have adequate evidence that he died. You got books that, in the back arguing Jesus didn't exist. You're I, talk I know, about that I know, but I, that's, I'm just saying that's not Sorry. what this debate. That's not what this debate is about. Um, but to answer your question, at, I think if Jesus res resurrected. We have to establish that he existed. I mean, he, for him to die, he has to rise again. Yeah, but if we're going to argue about just the stuff about his resurrection, we can grant for the sake of argument historicity but, but, and then move on. It's kind of cheating though because you have to grant something you don't even believe don't to make cheating. arguments. No, no, no. It's, it's just a practical way to narrow down the subject because we don't have like right. 10 hours to debate this. We've only so got two. So you don't two. see any good arguments. So <laughs> you don't see any good arguments. Uh, no, the, the best arguments, and, and you can see that in my book, I actually assign them, uh, I actually make them evidence for historicity mm -hmm. actually in, in the uh, a fortiori estimates, which are the estimates most against my position that I can reasonably believe possible. Um, which are the three passages in Paul where he alludes to Jesus having, uh, Jesus being of Davidic seed and uh, having being born of a mother and James the brother of the Lord. Mm -hmm. So those are the best evidence, and I think they're weak evidence, but they are the best evidence they have. And there, there really is no other evidence. All the other evidence dissolves upon examination. Mm -hmm. um, and like I said, when I do the final math in there, I actually count those as in favor of historicity against all the other evidence that we have. Mm -hmm. um, now, I personally think that there's much better explanations for those passages. I think they're actually weird if you try to interpret them in that sense. Uh, in the uh, historicity sense, but that's a whole other debate. Like, literally, we could debate just those three passages for two hours. Uh, so, 
And, uh, and I'd love to. <laughs> that, that's what yeah. we got to do in Dallas. No, seriously, we yeah. got to do this. That's good. And Dr. Bass, you're talking about, again, the uniqueness of the, the story of Jesus. But the reality is that his story does parallel a lot of pagan stories. The dying, rising, the renewal of the world. I mean, even C.S. Lewis said Jesus was the myth come alive. And St. Augustine talked about Christianity has existed from the beginning of time because he saw these stories just recycling themselves. So why do you think the parallels? Well, yeah, and I agree with, uh, I, think, I think there's two ways to look at it. I think, I think what Lewis and Tolkien, and, and really goes back to Chesterton, G.K. Chesterton, they're arguing that God prepared the minds, just as he prepared the minds of the Jews with the prophecies of the Messiah to come, he prepared the pagans with ideas of virgin births and different things, and he prepared that. Now, I, I grant that. I think that's, you know, that makes sense to me. But at the same time, when you actually go and look at the evidence, and like Mettinger, the definitive work on the resurrection in the ancient world, you find that the, the, the story of Jesus is actually unique, though, in comparison to all the others. There's a unique nature of it that's unparalleled. And so that's what I think is... Um, that, so I emphasize both, actually, because I love Tolkien and Lewis. And but it could, be, it could still be a unique lie or a unique well, fiction. Well, every, sorry, of course, that's fine. Every single like one of them was unique, though. It's All like, of them were unique. Osiris is unique compared to Romulus, uh, for example. Zalmoxus is unique compared to the others. Inanna is unique compared to the others. Um, even Mithras is an example. Which Mithras is not a dying and rising god, but he's still a similar savior figure. And it's still different, but the, the commonalities are there because he still has a passion. He still goes through a suffering and struggle through which he gains victory over death. So there, there are these common themes, and you see them all around the Mediterranean before the rise of Christianity. You do not see them in China, for example. Can, can, I, quote, so, can I quote you, though, on sure. historical Jesus? You said there is no evidence that Mithras was a resurrected Savior right. in uh, history. He was, he's not a resurrected Savior. Okay. No, no, he, he underwent a passion. He underwent a struggle or suffering, and actually the actual word of passion, for example. He had that kind of thing, but it wasn't a death and resurrection. But for some other gods, there were. Okay. But that's the similarity. Is they, they're all savior gods. They all go through some sort of suffering uh, that actually leads to their victory over death that they share with their followers through baptism and communal meals. And so when you see this all around the Mediterranean, then suddenly each culture is getting their own version of this. The Egyptians are getting it. The Persians in the Roman Empire are producing one. Uh, the, you know, the Syrians have one. The Greeks have one and so on. And then the Jews finally come up with one. Now, normally what we say in that, that's cultural diffusion. That's an example of a fashion spreading from culture to culture to culture. Each culture is taking it and turning it into their own version, their own version of it. So they Judaize it. So what makes, Christian, or what makes Jesus unique is all the Jewish parts of it, how they took the Jewish ideas and made a savior God out of the, out of the Jewish religion using the basic structure around them. The fact that this didn't occur in China, we don't have any dying and rising God in China, in ancient China anyway. We don't have any of this trend of these mystery cults, these salvation cults. We don't have baptism and communal meal cults in there. Um, so we can see the difference that it didn't arise there because there was no fashion for it. But there was a fashion for it, and that's exactly when Christianity arose, is precisely when it was fashionable for this kind of cult to arise. What about Bruce Lee? What do you mean by Bruce Lee? <laughs> <laughs> Rising and dying. But again, uh, like, oh. like Mettinger says, it's the historical figure of Jesus, and that's the thing. So if he grants the historical figure, oh, that's yeah, what's yeah, different that's, than all the other you know, dying That's, that's a good gods. point. They're all deities. Yeah, they're yeah. All, none of, nobody thinks that they're actually humans that walk the earth that were crucified, and we have the evidence within two years that all this happened. And so that's what's, that is completely, absolutely unique. Yeah, except and not borrowing from any pagan religions because except that's, that they the pagan did, religions. They did believe that Osiris walked the earth; that he was an actual person on oh, earth. But what's the evi what's the primary source? How how what's well, we the, don't have what's, any, the, what's the 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 dating between? We don't Osiris. have any reliable sources for Jesus either on this. But uh, but again, we don't, have, we don't have First Corinthians fifteen that's dated within two years. Yeah, well, when do you? Date if we're that, talking about right? resurrection, I oh the, the the creeds. Yeah, the creed. Um, I don't put a particular date on it. I'm completely fine with one Corinthians fifteen and Philippians two uh, dating to the origin of the religion. They could have been written down by okay. Peter himself so the day it, after You put it right there, right there at the early... early yeah, I, would, I, would, I don't know for sure, but so I would that's not. evidence. I mean, that's, that's strong evidence. That but you it, guys all keep all bringing says, up Peter, yeah. but Peter define was... Evidence. I'm sorry? Define evidence. Uh, define evidence, yeah. What's the It depends on which thing is. you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, you talk about Peter, but Peter was an illiterate fisherman. Well, so the Gospels claim. That's what the Gospels claim. Yeah, I think it's extremely unlikely. Um, because when you see Paul talking about inter interacting with Peter in the epistles, um, Paul defers to him a lot, or at least considers him an equal. If it were the case that Paul could read the scriptures and Peter could not, Paul would lord it all over him on that fact. He would say, I know the scriptures, I can read the damn scriptures, who are you? 
Um, but that never comes up. He treats him like an equal. He treats him like he knows what he's talking about, that he can actually read the scriptures. So I think Peter was probably a rabbi the same as Paul. Uh, and the idea of him becoming an illiterate fisherman is a similar thing that we see throughout religions to sort of make the movement more miraculous, just the same way the Muslims do with Muhammad and claim that Muhammad was illiterate and therefore he couldn't have written the Quran. That's a made-up story. Muhammad was the son of one of the wealthiest families, uh, mercantile families in the Arabian Peninsula. Um, there's no way he was illiterate, right? It's, so it's Im highly improbable. Uh, but nonetheless, they told that story to make it more miraculous that he could start this religion. So I think the Gospels are doing the same thing with the, the original apostles. I think the original apostles, in reality, were probably well-educated rabbis. They knew what they were talking about. All the evidence uh, goes against what he just said, but that's okay. But, <laughs> Only uh, the Gospels. Are, yeah, and the Gospels <laughs> are the considered gospels. reliable. I mean, I have this here. You know, Burridge... Uh, what are the Gospels? This is the definitive scholarly work on the Gospels, and unanimous cons the, the virtually unanimous consensus is the Gospels should be paralleled with Greco-Roman bios biographies, and, and that they are historical. Now, now many scholars like Bart Ehrman would say, well, they're still very unreliable. We can't trust a lot of things in them. Uh, many but of them are outright over, false, yeah. Over, but overly, we can trust there are many biographies. historical de details. One of them is that Peter was a fisherman. I mean, yeah, no, no, that's, that's you exactly question the, that. That's, that's part of that's your exactly imagination. The kind of, that's that's exactly the kind of thing about ancient biographies made up. Um, we you, have just many read, you just read that into Galatians. You, you didn't get that anywhere except here, right? No, the reading, idea that reading Peter the was a rabbi. Where did you get that Peter was Looking, a rabbi? All I do is infer this way, that Paul treats him like an equal but you, and treats him like he can actually read the scriptures. But it began here. This is where it began. No, it began in the letters of Paul. No, no. You reading the Paul. Why didn't anybody else discover that in the last 2,000 years? <laughs> well, it's because people have been believing the gospel and okay. taking them at face okay. value. <laughs> when you look right. at... When That's you, true. When, and it, Ehrman does They've this as well. They've been looking at the evidence. Bart Ehrman does this as well. Is he doesn't look at actual classical literature on biography, which uh, is extremely suspicious of almost all the contents of our biographies. Does Burris have, look at actual classical literature? If he doesn't come to this conclusion, then he didn't. But okay. the point of the matter because is... You say, because you say so. We, we have biographies of non-existent people, Romulus, Theseus, and so on. So there were biographies of non-existent yeah. people. So you can't say that because it's a biography, therefore it's reliable. You have completely fictional stories about completely fictional people. And they were... Presented God, as historical yeah. people. We have many biographies where uh, some of the experts on those things, like the biographies of Homer, the biographies of Euripides, the biographies of the early pre-Socratics, uh, classicists who've been analyzed these have found that the stories that are in them, they took things that were written in the, these people's books and then spun them out into stories about their lives and invented the whole biography of these people. Uh, that's the way biographies were written. It was, it, there, there are some biographies that maybe are based on eyewitness evidence, uh, for example, Xenophon's biographies. But that's, that's because, but, but that's the thing is we don't, Xenophon says how he knows his subjects when he talks about biogra biographical material. And that's we don't have we that have, in the Gospels. Well, it's great when we have independent corroborating details from Paul, from the Gospels, from the early tr uh, traditions. But not that From relate, even Josephus and Tacitus. But we're not that relate that, to these but, details. All we're these about. corroborate these details. Only the thing that, only the fact that uh, they believe Jesus died and was buried and, and appeared to them and told them that he was resurrected. Gentlemen, why don't, that's uh, it. Yeah. No, that's, 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 let's move to some questions because the crowd's getting some beer oh. and they're getting antsy. Yeah. And <laughs> Actually, I, I don't want to be the one crucified tonight. If I can help <laughs> it, so, uh, well, can, I, can I ask Rich one question? Sure, yeah, one question and then we'll go to the, we'll go to the, the well, audience. Something I was wanting to ask you because you, you make a big deal about, you know, and, and you did in your writings that, and you did tonight, that Paul converting was a, you know, we would expect that for an early movement. And so, so I was just, we is, would, that, is that correct? We would expect. <laughs> Sorry. That was that. <laughs> that was God. Boom. Yeah. No. <laughs> or Zeus. We would expect no, that Zeus to be. No, Zeus doesn't exist. We know that. We would expect that to be very infrequent. And the fact that it only happened once is by definition infrequent. Right. So, so I mean. In Mormonism, for example, you know, who is the, the person that persecuted Mormonism and they became a famous, converted and then became a famous Mormon? Who's that guy? I, I don't study They're, Mormonism they don't enough e to they, answer that question. They don't exist. What about uh, Muslim? You know, who persecuted the early Muslims and then became a Muslim himself and then became a famous Muslim? You don't think that's ever happened? You, you, but, but are, you, are you banking your reputation on that? That if no, I go no, out I, now no, on the internet? I know. I, well, tr <laughs> hey, trust me. I know at least with the big religions that didn't happen. And so... This is, by definition, Wait, extraordinary you're, you're for saying, Christianity. You're saying no one has been against a religion and then has converted to I'm that religion? No one. I'm saying with the biggest religions. Find evidence for Hinduism, Wait, for uh, Buddhism, no. for, for uh, Mormonism, for Even if we're talking Islam. the biggest religions, you're saying uh, some of you that on your no smartphones, one... Maybe you can look some you're evidence. saying no one in history has ever I didn't persecuted... Say no one. I didn't say no one. I'm showing you that Christianity I'm saying it's sets infrequent. apart. I'm saying it's, it's infrequent. set apart with the Paul story. You're agreeing That's it's infrequent, though. That's extraordinary. Yeah. And look at this one dude out of hundreds. 
that's we by can definition. compare it with other religions, though. So it's it's an yeah. extraordinary thing. No, no, I mean, it's, it's when, when you say you want extraordinary evidence, I just don't know what extraordinary means for you because no, we have early. No, no, dude, you got it backwards. Extraordinary is if all the Sanhedrin were converted. That would be extraordinary. One guy who's not even on the Sanhedrin, who's like some random dude out. At, he's not even a, Jude, a Judean Jew. He's a diaspora Jew. One dude. And he did so little. He did so One little. guy. Paul's letters were not even. We're talking hundreds, if not thousands, of persecutors of Christianity. Yeah. There, none of them have this experience. One dude does. That's that's infrequent. That's exactly and, what you'd expect if, and if Paul it's wasn't random. even popular. I mean, Tertullian calls him what the apostle to the heretic. I mean, he was more. The Gnostics were more interested in his writings until. Well, I think we've established. Uh, I, don't, I don't know about he, that. He, he hopes that if he Googled it, he'd find someone. But we've established that there is a unique thing with religions, with Christianity. I, I that's absolutely. I'm not sure what you're claiming because what you're claiming doesn't sound okay. logical. All right, at all. we can we can get okay. back to that. Why don't we go to the questions? All right, let's have a round of applause for both of the participants again. And thanks so much. Uh, Everybody's getting stoked. I can tell that this did exactly what we hoped it would do. Engender really good conversation and get your questions ready. The crew needs just a few minutes to change some camera angles. We are live streaming. It's working. We've got feedback from around the world. Really, really exciting tonight. So if you want a question, if you want to get That's a question in, there is a microphone the over uh, those uh, three Pauline in this aisle over here. Yeah, the Give them a couple of minutes and then start lining yeah. up and we'll take questions for about 20 minutes or so just, for, the, uh, the uh, for the debaters. Thanks, guys. Get into the Greek. We'll really geek out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'd like to acknowledge a special guest. She jumped up. She's first in line. She's ready with her question. Melissa Pugh, brand new president of Atheist Alliance of America, Hi. is here tonight. Thank you for joining us. She's Thank come up from Lincoln Book where she's relocated. And she bought me a glass of wine. So. I hey. did. I, I bought Dr. Bass. Start us off, of Melissa. OK, um, this is actually f more for Dr. Bass than it is for Dr. Carrier. But Dr. Bass, um, I know in Mark 16, 1, they talk about uh, Mary Magdalene and Jesus uh, curing her of her seven demons, seven devils. And also in John 20, 1 to 2, they talk about Mary Magdalene being the first to see the tomb empty. And then Paul comes along in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, which we all love about how women should be quiet in church, and if they have a question, they should ask their husbands afterwards. I just wanted to get your 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 thoughts on that. Uh, okay. I know it really doesn't have a lot to do with the the resurrection of Jesus, except for the you know well, the Mary Mary okay. being Mary Magdalene being the first to see the tomb open as okay. a woman. Well, okay. The fir on the first point, I just want to make the point that uh, you, the quote you, that you did about Mary Magdalene casting out yeah, be, seven Jesus. demons being casted out, that's in the longer ending of Mark, which I don't actually consider to be scripture. I think that was added later, clearly. Um, okay. So that's not, that's not there. But uh, in John 20, what you are looking for is what happened in John 20, because Mary Magdalene actually becomes kind of the apostle. She's the one who tells the apostles, I have seen the Lord. And so you have this very high, exalted picture of a woman uh, in the Gospel of John, for sure. Now, why Mary Magdalene isn't, you know, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene in the, in the creed, I don't know that. You know, I don't know the particular answer to that. Um, clearly, Peter, you know, Peter, even according to the Gospels, uh, Jesus appears to him very soon after the women. So, it just seems like Peter, hey, let's, if we're going to put a creed together, let's say Peter first, you know, this maybe, there had, had something to do with the women's testimony in that, that time. I don't know. You know, I just don't know the answer to that. But. So but but John, talking, 20, John 20 is what you like. I mean, John 20 is exalting Mary. And Paul even refers to some women as apostles. Well, okay, I'm saying I'm being told one question. <laughs> it's okay. I got to walk, a girl, I gotta a walk away. We'll talk about that later, about okay. the rest of that. Okay, good question. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Good question. Kevin, what do you got? I got one comment and then one question. My one comment is Lazarus was risen from the dead before Jesus. He was dead for three days and, and raised. So it's my He died again, but okay. Uh, but, he, but he's raised from the dead. Um, so the question I have is um, about what you think about Paul's account. Um, Mark talked about this, about the revelation being in Paul when he looked at it. He saw the sun being revealed in him in Galatians, mm -hmm. the revelation. Yeah. And his account in Acts uh, of, have, of, of being you know, knocked off the horse yeah. and then seeing him. Are those, I guess, what, what do you say about both of those events? Because both of those events seem to be different different experiences that he had 
uh, what do you think about the two, uh, the revelation that he had in him and the, the, the account of him being knocked on, off the horse and blinded? Yeah, well, it never says he's knocked off a horse, well, but it does, you know. He's blinded. and Yeah, the, the account is definitely different. Yeah, so I would okay, say, so are they the same or different, and what do you think about both yeah, for both you guys? I would say that uh, Galatians 1 is Paul's first-person account, and he is, I think, giving a more inner experience of what that happened. So he says, literally, the sun was revealed in me. It's the word in me in the Greek. And so uh, I think he's just, you know, if Jesus actually appeared to him bodily, which I think he did, he would have also had an inner experience as well. And so I think he's emphasizing that inner experience of what happened when Jesus appeared to him. Now, uh, the book of Acts is Luke giving us the account of what happened. Now, I think we do have agreement with the Galatians account because he says very soon after in Galatians 1 that I returned to Damascus. So you have this you know, parallel with corroborating uh, aspect of Damascus. So I do think it's the same account. But yeah, the, you know, one's a first-person account from Paul. One's Luke telling us what happened. So uh, there, there, of course, is going to be differences, but I don't think they're uh, contradictory. Um, I think they do. Uh, Paul says that when he had the revelation, he met, went immediately to Arabia for three years before returning to Damascus. Luke has him immediately go to Damascus and then consult with an actual Christian apostle uh, and actually immediately get inducted into the religion by a Christian, uh, former Christian believer. That absolutely contradicts what Paul says. Paul's very adamant that he never spoke to any actual apostles uh, before, for until at least three years later, when he eventually went to Jerusalem. And even then, he didn't. He doesn't mention meeting Ananias. He talks about meeting Cephas and possibly James. So, uh, so yeah, I see those as contradictions. I think Acts is writing a story that's very similar to what people <laughs> imagined at the time to be these revelations. So that may have been just a generic idea of how God appears to people or how Jesus appears to people. And, and he's, he wove a narrative about it. I don't think he's getting it from Paul. Um, but it is interesting to note that they are both revelatory experiences, even if you're going to have hysterical blindness associated with them, which is entirely the kind of thing that does happen throughout history in different religious uh, cults. So, so I think there, there, there's tying up there. They tie together in terms of the culture of the time, in terms of what visions were like for people. If I could just add to that, I, I think it's too strong to say absolutely a contradiction because we know Luke doesn't include everything he knows. And we know that because we know, and, and Dr. Gary agrees, that Luke had Mark when he was writing. And there's large portions of Mark that he leaves out. Great things, you know, Jesus walking on water, things that you'd think he would put in. You'd say, oh, well, of course Luke would put that in. Well, we know he didn't, and he, we know he knew about it because he had Mark before him. And so just because he doesn't mention the fact that he went to Arabia doesn't mean he didn't go to Arabia, doesn't mean he didn't even know about it. So uh, I don't that, think it, it doesn't show it. It's just an argument from silence. It's no, no, that doesn't work at all. Because uh, uh, <laughs> Acts, Acts says he goes immediately to Damascus and is blind until he gets to Damascus and then is, is, uh, interacts with Ananias who cures him of his blindness. He says, he says in Galatians that he returned to Damascus and then went to Arabia. Yes. No, no, he returned to Damascus three years after. He said he immediately goes to Arabia and comes back three years later. So unless Paul was blind no, no, for the three years. The language in Acts, the language in Acts allows for the, the going to Arabia. I don't think so. Okay, like good deal. <laughs> Arthur George, mythologist, what do you got for us? <laughs> yeah, it was interesting to me that uh, neither of you spoke much about the, uh, the empty tomb tradition. Uh, it was mostly about the appearance tradition, and uh, I, I'd like to hear more from each of you about that, and if you could comment on the historicity of, of, of that. And in particular, to focus on three things. One, uh, Paul didn't mention the empty tomb either, and I'm wondering whether each of, either of you think he had heard about that and, and why he didn't mention it. And second, what's interesting also to me is that the, in all four Gospels, the information that Christ has risen came from an angelic being and, and was transferred to the humans by the angelic being. So I wonder what, if the information comes from an angelic being, how do you get to historicity on the basis of that kind of testimony? And thirdly, uh, it turned out, nevertheless, that the people did not believe the empty tomb traditions. If you look at what happened after the angel, angelic beings talked, the people didn't believe it. It took the appearances for people to believe yeah, it. I so, so ultimately, why the empty tomb tradition? Paul doesn't mention it. We have angelic beings, as if that's really reliable. And the people didn't believe it anyway. They still relied on the appearances. 
Richard, you want to take that one first? Uh, oh, I, I thought that was a question directed okay, to you. Yeah, I, I forgot, Justin, if you go first, I would prefer. Okay, yeah. Uh, I, I, I mean, I believe in the empty tomb, tomb traditions. I think it, it shows and demonstrates that the bodily, uh, the bodily resurrection, we have it in the Mark, and many scholars argue for a pre-Markan passion narrative. I think Peter's just, you know, behind Mark, so we don't need that. But we also have an interesting case in Acts where... It says in Paul's sermon in Acts 13 that they buried him. It uses the plural. And so you have this burial of Jesus that's uh, not specifically, you know, I don't think it's contradictory, but it's it because I think Joseph and Arimathea probably needed help to bury Jesus. But it's interesting that you have this different account, and so that's one of those evidences of a, maybe a pre-literary tradition of the sermons in Acts chapter 13. But scholars like Gaze of Hermesh, who's, uh, uh, who is a Jewish, late Jewish scholar, uh, he says that when all the arguments come together, you have a tomb uh, that was empty. I mean, the, the, the historical evidence strongly points to an empty tomb uh, when, you, when you look at the multiple accounts. John also, so you have the Acts sermons, you have Mark, you have the John. And, and about Paul, let me, let me specifically answer that. So he says he was buried. It's the heiress passive. Buried by who? And so if Paul believed in a bodily resurrection, wherever he was buried, it would have been empty after he rose from the dead. But, but one thing I completely agree with you is that it was the appearances that made them believe. It wasn't the empty tomb, even according to the Gospels. I mean, they, they get to the empty tomb, and they're, like, scratching their heads. What happened? What happened? And I think that goes against, that, that strongly supports the expectation that the, even the disciples of Jesus had. They didn't expect him to rise from the dead. They thought for sure this was done, just like all the other 14 movements that I mentioned. When their leader was crucified, it was done. He's not the Messiah. So for some reason, they decided that this crucified man was the Messiah, even though... That's not the case in the 14 other movements. So what happened? I mean, you got to explain what happened. Yeah. And that argues for the resurrection. But that's all based on the Gospels, which we can't trace to any eyewitness source, uh, any named eyewitness source at all. So just the fact that they're telling these stories doesn't mean we don't have this account from an actual apostle who actually went to the tomb and saw it empty. Paul doesn't mention there being an empty tomb. He never mentions anyone discovering it. It's never part of their creed. Uh, it's never part of the evidence that he thinks is relevant to his story. Um, and uh, the, the only time it first appears is in Mark, decades later, many decades later. Uh, and Mark is writing a story in which he has it end with the women not telling anyone about the empty tomb, right? So it seems to me that he's doing a literary construct. That the empty tomb is symbolic for him. It represents the thing that he wants to communicate. It's not a story that he actually learned from anyone who was there. Uh, and certainly we don't have any way to prove that it was a story that it, from anyone who was there. He doesn't cite any witnesses as being his source for that story. Um, and so we have no idea where he got the story or where it came from. Uh, and then all the other versions of the empty tomb story are just embellishments on that. You get like Matthew, now he adds angels flying down from heaven and striking the guards, uh, you know, half dead, even though there were no guards there in Mark. Mark had never heard of guards or any of this story. But Matthew makes this big, fabulous story out of it. Uh, Luke gets rid of the guards and the, the flying angel, but he has two angels instead of the one young man. Uh, and then he has this whole sequence of events where the women go and tell the men, and then the men come and ch double check the tomb. You know, it just gets more elaborate over time. Um, so I think generally when you're looking at myths like this, you're looking at stories like this, they look like myths. And so we don't usually believe these things as being the case. And just to add to that, if, if you go back to the actual beliefs of Paul, if he believed in a bodily resurrection, then wherever Jesus was buried, you know, whatever the tomb it was, whatever it was, it would have been empty. And that's exactly what Marcus Bachmuller and yeah. the Cambridge Companion, companion to Jesus, he makes that exact point. He says wherever Jesus was buried, he, he doesn't even... Uh, fully, I think, subscribe to the empty tomb, but he says, Paul says he was buried, and wherever he was buried, it would have been empty after Jesus rose from the dead. Yeah, first of all, that would be an inference. In resurrection. That would be an inference, not actual evidence of it being empty, right? And you can I believe that it's empty without having checked or being able to check. Um, but the other thing is that Paul actually goes out of his way to say that the body that dies is not the body that rises, uh, and he talks about it being two separate bodies. Uh, and no, we no. have examples like in Josephus and Josephus' description of the Essenes, uh, the Essenic belief in resurrection was that the old body gets thrown away and a new body is replaced. No, no, G Josephus uses anabio, the, the exact same word that she that uses in the going, second, second Maccabees 7. That just the means exact going, same word. That just means up to life. That's, it doesn't yeah, matter. And, but he's using the yeah. same word that the Maccabean yeah. You don't think a Pharisee like Josephus or Paul would have been inspired by the Maccabean Paul word? said Phariseeism was rubbish. He said he rejected the Pharisee cult. That's right. That's in Philippians, right? He says it was all as awful to me. He's got rid of a, his Pharisee. Well, he's talking Pharisee about beliefs. his previous background of not knowing Christ. Yeah, yeah, but he's I mean, not talking about... He no, claims he, to be a Pharisee in the book of Acts. No, he abandoned all he of that He says, I'm stuff. a Pharisee, says, the son of the Pharisees. No, he says he was a Pharisee. He's no longer. 
Uh, no, he says, people, I'm a son of the Pharisees. Let's people can change text. sex. You can have a Catholic become a Protestant or a Protestant become a Catholic. The same way you can have a Pharisee become a Christian. The point is, if Paul and Josephus, Josephus stayed a Pharisee, yeah, but, if they believed in the Maccabee, if they were inspired by the Maccabean martyrs, the Maccabean martyrs, uh, you definitely agree, are, believe in bodily resurrection. A, Paul never references the, the same body. It, but he never references that. That's one Jewish belief. It's, that's it's, not. It, it Paul says in 2 Corinthians. We know, the hist we know that Josephus two, definitely two talks Corinthians about five, okay, better, two, one okay. question. that. 2 Corinthians 5. Thanks, Miguel. I have yeah, to say, yeah. two, 2 Corinthians 5, Paul says our resurrection bodies are already built. They're already waiting for us in heaven. No, so that's a, very, a separate body. You're taking a very, very you know, multiple different interpretations of the Bible. Yeah, we're talking about 1 Corinthians 15. It's a transformed yeah, body. It's a big line here. Big thing. Line no. Thanks, Arthur. Thank, so, thank yeah. you. I'll follow up with a beer. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> Let's get to the next one. Good question, though. Step up, sir. Tell us your name and your question. Hi, my name is Christian Becker. Uh, just a couple things I've picked up over the years. Uh, one, I heard that I've heard that the the third day being significant didn't originate with Jesus. That was a Jewish custom. People died. They were left unburied for three days to avoid the unfortunate situation of people being buried alive. And the second thing I heard is that uh, the idea of uh, spikes being driven into Jesus was an anachronism, that that kind of metallurgy doesn't exist at that day. So what was like the word you used? Something driven in, what was driven uh, into Spikes. Jesus? Oh, spikes. Yes. You yes. mean nails? I... Yeah, nails. That they, that they didn't have the metallurgy to make the, Oh, they very Make definitely nails did. Those, in those oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's yeah. They they were, had very sophisticated nail making technology. Yeah. Actually, we fe we found yeah bodies that with nails even in the actual yeah. bone. It, you can it, go it, look at that online. That's so the thing. Google. I'll address yeah. the other point too. Is that it was against Jewish law to allow a body un to be unburied before to after sundown. So you had to bury a body before the sun went down. My name's Clayton Walker. Uh, I have a question more specifically for Richard. Uh, I just was kind of taken aback by your saying that Peter had to have been a rabbi because Paul held him in high esteem. I mean, mm, more that, like he held him as an equal. Okay, so he not, held not him as he, an, not that he put him above himself. At no, all. he didn't, and he talked about you know that there are some who claim to be super apostles, and that I am the least of all these. Uh, but I mean. He, he regarded him as equal, so how does that make him a rabbi and then not a fisherman? I mean, he was literally someone who was walk. If, he, if you were someone who had now been converted to Christianity, I mean, Peter would obviously be held in high regard. He was supposedly the person that Jesus said, I, your name is Cephas, and on this rock I will build my church. Peter, along with James, were they were the two most respected leaders in the entire church, so of course he's going to hold him as his equal. No, that's not normally how it would work in the social system of the time. Uh, okay. Paul says in Romans 16 that the gospel was learned from the scriptures and from Revelation. And he often references the scriptures and says, you learn from the scriptures, everything is according to the scriptures, you learn things from the scriptures, if you want to learn stuff, you have to go to the scriptures to learn it. If Peter could not read the scriptures, Paul would be lording, he'd be using that argument all over the place and saying, he can't even read the scriptures, I can read the scriptures. And so that would actually make Paul of higher station and actually higher authority because he can actually access the word of God in the scriptures. Um, and the fact that he never uses that argument, he just, it, that's not even an argument he uses, means that he assumed that Peter could read the scriptures, that he couldn't challenge him on that fact, that he couldn't say that he's a, he's a more important member of the church because he actually can access the scriptures. I think that would actually have been an argument in there. And so I think that's an example of how uh, that would work. But also in terms of general religious movements generally, they usually start from people who are educated insiders. And so that, that's an actual common phenomenon. We don't have actually any examples of actual illiterate people starting world religions like this, right? So it's usually someone who actually has some sort of information. Joseph Smith, for example, they often claim that he didn't study anything before he created this Mormonism. But in fact, he did. He actually you know, researched the stuff he could read. Right. So, um, so that's uh, when you look at the general trends in the history of religions and when you look at the evidence of what arguments Paul didn't use, uh, that but he, that, he, that goes from a premise that he's trying to compete with Peter and James, and he wasn't. Um, he really he wasn't. He it very him, much he, does. He calls them the three pillars. I mean, I, I think this is... But the, there wasn't know, an just, open this is, this competition just read, just to read control Galatians Christianity. That, that, that's not what it was. P, James, mm -hmm. Peter, he was actually going there to meet with the church, and yeah. he did go out and preach by himself without having to consult with mm -hmm. the church, and then later on yeah. came in, and then he finally met him how many years later, but... It, and had it was just an issue over the, over, um, Jesus. I mean, 
But over he, circumcision he and circum that was the main issue. It was over yeah, circumcision and his believers. It has nothing to do with mm -hmm. competing over the church. Like he's got to make this argument. You can't read, so I'm smarter than you. Like, it's not a smarter thing. It's a question of access to the scriptures. The scriptures it's about were fundamental. Authority. It's about authority. The whole Christian religion is fundamentally built on the scriptures. You could not have started Christianity without being able to read the scriptures. It's impossible. No, you'd never get Christianity from reading yeah, but the scriptures. The, the, yeah, but we're, we're going to have to keep yeah. that, that makes never sense. Get, that's, it was completely unexpected. A, a death, a no, Messiah no, no. dying and rising the again. Christian You're not going to find that in the Old the Testament The Christian scriptures. creed is so fundamentally based on the scriptures that the reference to the scriptures is in the creed. But they, found, they realized that post Jesus. You already said that it was All Paul's right, revelation. It was the revelation <laughs> to Paul. And, and, and also, it was not an revelation oral and scriptures. All right, we got a lot of questions to get through, buddy. Noah, let's read it in oral tradition. Then they realize it shed new Thank you. Great question, obviously. Thank you. And the follow up afterwards. Let's keep it to one question, one part questions. Thank you. No Go ahead. Peter. What's your name, buddy? <laughs> Hi, one question. My name is Matt Kenyon. Thanks, man. Uh, my, my understanding is, is that my salvation as a human being is, is, as I believe we agree, Justin, is based in my belief in Jesus Christ being the divine son of God, right? So if the only place that I can look to get historicity on that and believe in the resurrection and the divinity of God is from the scriptures. And as you stated yourself, that's from many different writers, many different interpretations, many different scribes over the ages. Why oh my is God, my God. salvation so based in this book that's been written thousands of years ago, reinterpreted, and now we have, as we see today, a debate about the understanding of even those words are written. You're talking me out of the faith. Stop that. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> what, You're really not. What, I mean, because I didn't say any of those things. But how, that's okay. how am I? <laughs> how how am I supposed to base my salvation in something that clearly has a lot of contention to it? Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I, let, let's 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 say two things. You know, I think one, I think it's very solid and very cohesive. It, it, it it's amazing. You know, the fulfillment of prophecies, the the early evidence, the multiple attestation. I think it's compelling. I think the evidence is compelling. But I'll make the point. No, you don't need, I mean, think about how many people who have been Christians and have come to Christ not knowing the historical evidence that I presented tonight. There's a ton. So you don't have to know this evidence to, to be a believer. I'm just, as I go and wanting to present evidence to people who question the faith, I'm, I'm seeking to present what I consider compelling evidence that it's true. But I do believe that you can immediately experience God. You can immediately experience uh, the risen Christ by calling out to him. I and mean, Paul says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. I mean, when Paul went around proclaiming uh, the gospel, he definitely probably gave evidence. We see it in Acts 17 and things. But there's no doubt the majority of people, majority of people that have become Christians has not become Christians because of this historical evidence. The historical evidence is amazing. But a ton of people, but majority of people have come to Christ because they have experienced Christ in their life. And of course, I've experienced Christ. But I'm trying to lay out historical evidence not base everything on experience, base it on the actual historical evidence. Yeah, this to me is an example of the problem with this backwards idea of how evidence works. Um, the evidence isn't amazing, actually. I experienced the Tao. I was a firm, true believer in the Tao because I actually experienced it in me, and I actually experienced the universe through my contact with the Tao, through my mystical experiences when I was younger, um, when What's I was the a young man. evidence that the Tao is true? Uh, well, at the time, it was all the fact that it works in your life, right? Yeah, so it's experience. No, but I think that the There's historical, no historical, the historical evidence is insignificant compared to pretty much any other religion. It's the same kind of historical evidence we have for Mormonism. It's the same kind of historical evidence we, we have for the cargo cults, for, for anything like that. So it's, it's not reliable enough to establish that. But that's, that's the plates. key. You're going to compare golden plates to resurrection? Stop that. Uh, uh, but, the evidence is, but the evidence is better, so it doesn't matter. For golden plates, though. Um, I don't care if they have golden plates. There's more golden plates in rap videos. Yeah, but it's still, no, no, but it's Moroni. The angel, seeing the angel Moroni also is. They, oh there were witnesses testifying oh to that. God. Yeah, I, I agree that your reaction is exactly the correct way to react. And when someone says, I saw an angel. Yes, there's no evidence. And that's what, uh, yeah. that's my point. Exactly. I, I, have, I, have, um, I have a debate with myself which religion is going to fall first, Scientology or Mormonism. One of the two yeah, will fall soon. If, if, right. If someone came up, well, Scientology is going to end soon, I imagine. Once but, Tom Cruise dies. Um, <laughs> No, if someone told me Gandhi uh, resurrected from the dead and he's alive today and he has an important message for me, I'd say, what's his phone number? Um, that's the thing is if Jesus is alive now, he, he, I could just chat with him. I should be able to just have a conversation with him and talk about stuff. Um, I can't. Uh, even people who have Jesus come into their heart, it's only what they think 
Jesus is supposed to tell them. They don't get any kind of unique insight. They don't, get, they don't sit down and actually have a conversation with a bodily Jesus. Well, can I ask you about that? So if Jesus appeared to you right now and started talking to you, and he really did, mm -hmm. wouldn't you consider a naturalix, naturalistic explanation more likely than that? Oh, it would, the, the game would be on wouldn't it, wouldn't, it be more likely that, <laughs> what, what, wouldn't it be more likely that someone put Bill Cosby juice in there and, and is making well, that, you hallucinate nope. or something? All right. Okay, but <laughs> no, what I, what I would do when I encountered that situation Somebody is I would, say, I, would immediately, I would immediately know that, okay, something extraordinary is happening now. Um, yes, I would have to rule out those other things, but uh, I would obviously have to be able to. If he's God, he can tell me some way that I can actually rule out hallucination. But, but that's, that's kind of my point. That's kind of my point. I think, I think because of your worldview, you are not allowed. No, I could easily be convinced. I could easily be convinced. There are a number of things that if I could get to chat but, with but, Jesus. But you agree a naturalistic explanation is more likely than Jesus actually coming and appearing before oh, it's, you right it's, now. It's the better way to that's put it. That's always more likely. The better way to put it, no, that's the wrong way to put it. You're talking about you're confusing prior probabilities with posterior probabilities. The, the way to put it is I would... I I now have to eliminate those other hypotheses before I can get to that one. It's the same as you, you study any right, other John, scientific fact. We're getting fact. a little complicated again. Okay. We better go to the next question. <laughs> yeah. Hi. Uh, my name is David Ernst. Um, my question is, uh, do you have any corroborating evidence outside of the Bible? And I would mean like, you know, Roman tax documents or something of the like. Uh, because as I understand, the Bible is largely the claim of Christian belief, not the evidence. Okay. Yeah. Well, I, one, it, you need to, you definitely need to look at, you know, even the atheist scholars like Gerd Ludemann, Bart Ehrman, you know, look at many scholars who will tell you that the ne the New Testament, just because people believe it's the Word of God, doesn't mean it suddenly doesn't count as historical evidence anymore. I mean, it, it definitely, even if it's unreliable, it supports certain things. It says Pontius Pilate lived, for example. It talks about things that actually did happen in history. Now. Corroborating evidence, I would point to Josephus and I'd point to Tacitus, which both refer to Jesus within about, uh, Josephus still in the first century, Tacitus is early second century. Both Josephus and Tacitus, Tacitus specifically, we know, says something about a superstition that broke out. And when you look at this language of superstition, it's very possible that that's what he, uh, he's talking about, the resurrection, this belief in a resurrection. He calls it a superstition, you know, a negative way to, to refer to it. Josephus in the, you know, infamous place where some Christian scribe, you know, messed with it, which when I get to heaven, I'm going to beat him down, let me tell you, whoever messed with that, because I want to know what Josephus actually really did say, because I think we can get an idea of some of the things he said, but I do think he might have said something like that they believed that he had risen from the dead, which is, you know, the, the scribe definitely messed that up, but it's possible that Josephus references it as well, but bare minimum, Josephus references and Tacitus referenced Jesus and, and, their, and his crucifixion. Yeah, I, I suspect that's not the case, but even if it was, uh, what he's saying actually is correct at that level. If you're going to assume that these passages were there as written, uh, the Josephus one definitely was not there as written, so that's so tainted as evidence it would not pass any muster in any evidential standard uh, in any court of law or at any level. So um, once you have something that corrupted, you can't know what Josephus originally wrote, so it's use useless as evidence. Uh, but even if whatever he wrote, it would have been based on what Christian informants were telling him, and that would be based on the Gospels. So it's not, you can't get to a corroboration of the Gospels that way. Um, same with Tacitus, is that his most likely source, if that's what he actually wrote, would have been Christians who were just repeating the Gospels at him. Uh, so we, don't, we can't show, we can't prove that Tacitus independently checked any evidence relating to the resurrection of Jesus. So we can't use that either. It's, that's the definition of unreliable evidence. We can't do that. Um, so there, there isn't anything outside the Bible. And we have to point out that the New Testament is a collection of books, all of which are written by fanatical believers saying tons of uncorroborated, suspicious things. Um, that's the worst kind of evidence you can have for anything in history. So. I Godless engineer you. drove up from Alabama to cover the event, and uh, thanks for making the drive, and thanks for uh, all that you do, uh, for spreading the word and being a friend of the program. Go with your question, um, Justin. Considering that you uh, said earlier that the Bible or the collection of books that make up the Bible uh, are unanimous, unanimously considered to be historical. Uh, and and uh, it's unanimously considered that they, we can find historical truths in them. Yes. 
Okay, well, I'm just kind of curious how you rationalize the various contradictions uh, to play off the topic of this debate, the contradictions let alone in just the finding of the empty tomb, because in each of the Gospels, they find it in different ways, like yeah. uh, Dr. Carrier pointed out earlier. Right. One, two women find it, and that's the end of the Gospel. And another one, angel comes down from heaven, you know, slaps away the stone, and is like, ah, oh, hey, guys. You know, there's no Jesus here. Go find him elsewhere. I haven't seen uh, that translation, but I like that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm summarizing, right. you know. I mean, but, but from, from one to the other, I mean, that's pretty much just like, you know, somebody being like, well, that guy shot that guy. Uh, but then another person was like, uh, no, that guy didn't shoot that guy. Yeah. Well, you know, an angel came down from heaven, shot that guy <laughs> with a heart attack, and then went back up into heaven. And so it, it, I'm just kind of curious how you rationalize the, uh, the Bible or the collection of the books, you know, uh, being able to find historical evidence in it when it's categorically been shown to not have historical evidence or, or at least contradictions. Yeah, uh, okay. Let, let's assume the contradictions. Now, now, hopefully Dr. Carey would agree with this, that when you look at the ancient world, just about every event that we know happened that we believe, you know, based on as much as his history can tell us, there's multiple accounts and there's tons of contradictions. A good example would be the uh, fire of Rome, right? You know, the fire of Rome under uh, Emperor Nero. You know, Dio Cassius, uh, Suetonius, Tacitus, those are our evidence that that happened. Everybody agrees the fire of Rome happened, but guess what? They all disagree on all kinds of different ancillary details. Guess what it is with the Gospels? They disagree on ancil ancillary details. How many women were at the tomb, how many angels, blah, blah, blah. Empty tomb, that is agreed upon by everybody. So if you if parallel to other events that we know happened, it's, contradictions mean nothing. So, so you, you need to parallel the Gospels. You need to equate the Gospels with other ancient history. So contradictions, even if the contradictions were there, I think they're harmonizable. But even if they're there, it still doesn't prove that it didn't happen. In fact, it shows that they're independent, that they didn't collude, and it shows that the main thing that they all agree on probably did happen. Because they, because they so-called contradict, right? So the empty tomb would actually be supported by contradiction, I think, rather than the opposite. No, absolutely not. Uh, that's, no, no historian would ever do history that way in the ancient, ancient history field. Um, Every event in can, the ancient world has contradictions. Yeah, and we admit, okay. then, we admit then that all the other ones are false, right? If there's contradictions, you know most of them are false. Only one of those accounts can be true. Or one of those details. No, no, the, the event, so the event making, that they all agree on. The, yeah, yeah, the but, but you, you, don't, you don't mistakenly forget about a flying angel who flies down from outer space and knocks the tomb, and then suddenly there's guards there and they knock them out and stuff like that. Um, you don't forget that. Uh, but, 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 so, so someone made that up. That's a lie. Someone no, made no, that well, up. But, but, but the empty tomb would be the fact. Empty it doesn't tomb matter. Would be the no, fact. no. But this, but this is a story. If, no, no. It, one dude made up the story. The empty tomb is the fact. There's only one guy who says about an empty tomb. Mark. Mark is the only guy who knows about an empty tomb and reports it. All the other I've versions. Already argued why, why, all the other versions of the empty tomb story are redactions has, has of Mark. They're all place. rewrites of okay. Mark. Even no, John. No, we still have a long line. So why don't we do this? Yeah. We have a, the question and then one rebuttal and then we go right to the next sure. question because we got lots of people want to have a lot to say. Yeah. Go ahead, sir. Thank you. Uh, my answer. name is Mike Samuels. Um, the question comes from a friend of mine who was supposed to come tonight but couldn't, so he's been watching the live feed. And it's more of a comment that I'd like for both of you to respond to. He said, uh, by the way, he's a, um, a Baptist uh, young earth creationist, is, are his beliefs. Um, <laughs> they're not mine, I'm sorry. <laughs> Please consider three people. James, the brother of Jesus, Thomas, the disciple, and Paul. James did not believe in Jesus up until the resurrection. Thomas was skeptical about the resurrection, and Paul went so far as to persecute what he perceived to be heretical believers. All three were willing to pay with their lives because they had seen the risen Christ, and they died alone. This was not a case of mob hysteria. Their lives were not valuable valuable to them in the light of the fact that they had seen the risen Christ. Nobody in his right mind would die a violent death for what one would know to be a certain lie. As a matter of fact, very few people would be willing to die even for the truth. That is his comment, and I would appreciate your 
both of your reactions to it. Well, first of all, Thomas the Disciple, we have no evidence that he even existed other than John making him up. Um, he, he doesn't exist in any other lists uh, or prior accounts of the apostles encountering the resurrected Jesus um, or, or even any reliable evidence of his death either. We don't know the circumstances of his death. We don't have any kind of uh, reliable historical accounts for that. So we really can't count Thomas the Disciple. Um, James, we also, James the brother of Jesus, uh, if, if he existed, if Jesus existed and James was his brother and, and so on, we don't have any evidence that he didn't convert before uh, the death of Jesus because it's actually just left out of the story. We actually don't have any account in any of the Gospels or Acts of a conversion of James, the brother of Jesus. In fact, Acts 1 has the brothers of Jesus just already in his church uh, without explanation. So they're already followers. Um, so that's just left out as to when and why they became followers. Um, so we can't use that argument either. And then it comes to the question, we know uh, James, the brother of Jesus, we have no reliable accounts, or actually really any accounts, uh, if, depending on how you interpret the evidence, of his death or why he died or what he died for or whether he could have recanted and survived. And this is the biggest problem with those kinds of arguments is that if the situation they were in is such that even recanting would not save them, then there's no point to recant. So you can't actually use that as an argument that they're dying for their belief. They're going to die anyway, so they might as well just affirm their Christian belief and hope it works when they're, when they're, you know, when they're finished. Um, but also people can die for other reasons. They can, like I mentioned in my, uh, in my debate uh, speeches, uh, you can die thinking that this religion is going to be a good thing for the world, and therefore you should die for the lie that will convince people to behave in the way the, and reform society in the ways that you want. That's another reason you could do it. Or you could have visions or dreams or whatever that convinced you, really genuinely convinced you that Jesus actually rose from the dead, even though he didn't. And you could genuinely believe that that vision was correct and accurate and that therefore uh, Jesus was resurrected from the dead. And you can die for that belief. It doesn't, make the fact that the, it doesn't change the fact that it was still a hallucination or a dream. It was your subconscious doing it. So you can't use this die for a lie argument to get to the truth. Um, it, it doesn't work in this case because we don't have the data we need even to get to it in terms of what exactly it was that they were dying for and whether even recanting would have saved them. As I hear these things, I mean, it, he's incredibly creative, but there's just no evidence for a ton of things he says. But James and Paul, we have solid evidence for that they, uh, they're in that 1 Corinthians 15 creed, so they're in that earliest testimony going back to within two Not years. Not the brother of the Lord. doesn't say the brother of the Lord in 1 Corinthians 15. It says James. Yeah, James the brother of John. He's part of the pillars. James, John, and Peter. Come on. The, the, the One of the first apostles. Yeah. No. James, the brother of Jesus, is exactly it's not the James in the, he's referring It's not in to. 1 Corinthians 15. In Galatians 1, he refers to him as James, the brother of the Lord. So, uh, How do you know that's the same James in 1 Corinthians 15? Again, uh, this is, again, just Because in the next local book, to Richard in Carrier, Galatians 2, he this. talks about James was one of the Nobody pillars. Nobody agrees with this. So, James is one of the pillars, and he's the brother of John. He's not the brother of the Lord. No. So, so he appeared to James in 1 Corinthians here. 15. This is unanimous. I mean, even the most atheist scholars. It's not the brother of the Lord. Herman agrees with that. Everyone agrees with that. It doesn't say it's the brother of the Lord. Carrier disagrees with this again. So you have the brother the of the Lord. The fact that it doesn't say he's the brother of the Lord is fact. It's not my opinion. It says he's the brother of the Lord. When Paul says not he appeared to James 15. without more explanation, there's he's multiple Jameses in the him. church. You know that. But that's the James that was dominant. He was the leader in Jerusalem. But it doesn't say that in 1 Corinthians 15 that's as to clear, which James. That's what everyone agrees on. But so it anyways, doesn't he say it. He it doesn't appeared, matter what people think. It doesn't say it. It's not James. there. This is only in your it's mind. In your, this is only in your mind, Richard. The brother of the Lord is not in 1 Corinthians 15. It's only That's in not in my that mind. Peter was a rabbi. It's only in Do your I mind. Do I have to get out the Bible and read it? <laughs> <laughs> yes, it says he appeared to James, and it says he's the brother it does of the not Lord. No, it doesn't right. say okay, he's the brother of the Lord. Let's go back. Every question is a debate. Every question is a debate. Next question. Well, I didn't get to answer that question. It's Peter Isley from SNAP, the Survivors Network of Those Abused by Priests. Let me let Justin answer that. Yeah, I didn't get to That's a good point. Let's be fair. Let's answer, yeah. I agree. Okay, so uh, the first, uh, he appeared to James, Jesus' brother, which is the unanimous testimony, even with atheist scholars, agnostic scholars. He appeared to Paul, which everyone agrees on, so that's a true transformation. I agree with them that we only have the evidence of Thomas and John, so we can't prove anything, but I don't think that uh, it's a good reason to say that he didn't exist or he made it up. That, that's just in one source. Josephus is also just one source. But we also have that James died from Josephus. It's actually in Josephus that James, the brother of Jesus, which parallels with Galatians, so we have both saying, brother of Jesus, James, he died, it doesn't say for the faith, but it does say he died as a breaker of the law, as for blasphemy in Josephus. So what was he, what, what, why did the high priest want to do that? I think it's good evidence that he was probably 
because he believed that Jesus, a crucified man, was God, that he was God in the flesh. And this is why he was competing with the high priest. This is what most Josephan scholars would say, that uh, the reason why James ended up being put to death, and Josephus even sides with James as the, the righteous one. So we have good evidence that, especially Paul, I mean, we know Paul took beatings. We know Paul was stoned. He was, I mean, we can definitely, inference to the best explanation, say that Paul, under Nero, would not have recounted his faith. And so, and we're, we're told at First Clement that Paul died as a martyr. So we have good reason that Paul, James, and Peter, Bart Ehrman would agree, you can ask him when he comes uh, in October, that all three of them died for their faith as martyrs. But we don't know what it was they believed in that they were dying for, whether it was a vision or not, for example, and we don't know if recanting could have saved them. So it's unusable as evidence. No, it's not unusable. Even if it was true. We know they died believing that Jesus rose. And they were in a place to know. That's what's significant about None that. Of that's different than the 9-11 that. martyrs. That's different than... Joseph, th th this is very different because they were in a place to know whether Jesus rose from the dead. But none of the sources say that's what they were dying for in terms of whether it was a vision or not. No. All right, gentlemen, your hyper-skepticism is, is selective to Christianity. Next question. It's yeah, the, the, this, this is like says, Thanksgiving yeah. at my house, but with citations yeah. and footnotes. <laughs> <laughs> with citations. <laughs> not that I'm making a position on this, but if, we, if religion would ever have to be replaced with something, it, we should pick courtesy. That's the replacement. Um, but it's, I, I guess what I wanted to say, and it's probably never good to have two IPA beers and then come up to a microphone. <laughs> <laughs> so, streaming. Um, but I wanted to thank the organization. Uh, I'm a, a victim as a child of a, a childhood rape by a Catholic priest. And I was a founder 20 years ago of a now global organization of 18,000 survivors of childhood sexual abuse. Mm -hmm. And thank you. Okay. And I guess what I want to want to I'm going to do something that I hate people do, which is to make an observation and not necessarily have a question. <laughs> so I apologize for that. But um, what you are talking about today, what we're talking about today, literally especially in Milwaukee, the bodily resurrection of Jesus became the central issue in the legal battle for 600 victims of survivors here in order to receive compensation from the archdiocese for the crimes that were committed against them and the cover-up against them as children. And it was about the bodily resurrection, literally. How? So it's really yeah, about, so? <laughs> yeah. you're like, really? Oh, my God. Yeah, yeah. Do you tell the, 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 and I guess what, I, what, I, what I'm <clears throat> saying here is about the ethical and political consequences that persist today about this very question, which is kind of amazing, right? Um, the Archdiocese of Milwaukee um, moved before it declared bankruptcy. Um, $60 million, they moved $300 million, but $60 million in particular, into a cemetery trust. They already had a trust, but they took money and created a new trust, arguing that that money could not be examined by the court for compensation because of the belief that Catholics have and Christians have in the resurrection of Jesus and what the cemeteries mean in that regard. And a federal judge here ruled, Judge Randa, based on the Christian belief in the bodily resurrection in his argument, in his ruling, he said about the bodily resurrection of Jesus, of which Jesus was the first to have bodily rose, according to Christian belief, that the cemeteries that, you know, that in, in Milwaukee, of the Catholic cemeteries, that every Catholic um, has a expectation that their body, according to their belief, is going to be rose and, risen at the end of time. So the, kind of the reanimation of corpses. And, and the judge himself had plots, it was found out later. He had purchased plots in the cemetery, so he believed in it, okay? And that for this reason, although this was quite likely fraudulently constituted under U.S. law, that it was fraudulent to do this, uh, and that the person who did it was the leading, now leading Catholic in the United States, Cardinal Timothy Dolan of New York, he did it while he was Archbishop of Milwaukee, got permission from the Vatican to do it, explicitly stated in, in a letter to the Vatican he was doing it in order, in part, not to get money to victims of sexual abuse by priests, and that this religious belief in the bodily resurrection of Jesus and the cemeteries prohibited any court from examining whether this was fraudulently constituted or anything. It couldn't be done. So what's amazing about this is not whether you believe it or, or not, that's not the point. It's not just a private matter. That's what I'm trying to say. 
the lives of, of hundreds and hundreds of victims of abuse, including not the, the release of documents that are still sealed now in court, in part because of this action, of known abusers, or possibly known abusers, is because of this very abstract, kind of abstract and fascinating debate that we're having right now. Right. And, and, and so I, I'm not sure if you want to comment on this, but you guys, but on the ethical and political current consequences thousands of years later of this very debate that we're having today is really simply astounding. And, astounding. and I think that my final thing about this would be that if Jesus rose from the, bet, from the dead, let's just assume that he did, it would have been better and I can guarantee you, for so many children harmed in this archdiocese, if he hadn't risen from the dead. Yeah. That's for you, I think, if you want. Do you have a comment on that? Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. I don't have a comment. Go ahead. What's your name? Hi. My name is Whitney. I have a pre I guess it's kind of a boring question, <laughs> but um, you both kind of talked a little bit about what you would define as reliable evidence, like um, you know it happening as close to the actual event as possible, or actual eyewitness sources, you know those sorts of things. Um, if you put your personal opinion or uh, religious belief or lack of religious belief aside, just uh, ranking. Um, number uh, amount of historical evidence which religion of all the ones that you've studied would you say is on the top as having the most reliable historical evidence would in your opinion you know opinion as, opinions aside personal opinions beliefs aside just historical evidence only would you say that Christianity in your opinion, is pretty high up on the list? Would you say it's at the bottom of the list compared to other evidences we have for ancient religions? D does my question make sense? Uh, yeah. I think you know my answer, so I'll yeah, explain. Yeah. <laughs> <It's>, uh, <laughs> I'll explain why the, the question is kind I of... I came here to defend that, so... <laughs> yeah. Why the question is quite, kind of impossible to answer. Um, so, let's... Uh, first of all, they all suck. So, so it, we're just talking about relative... <laughs> we're talking about relative evidence Except for quality. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I think the evidence sucks for all religions, so uh, in my, my uh, analysis of the evidence. But I would say that Mormonism has, in some respects, better evidence than Christianity, but in other respects, it doesn't. For example, for Mormonism, we have so much documentation, we can actually find problems in the evidence, and we can actually look at reasons, we, actually, we can actually accumulate reasons to doubt yeah. the authenticity of Mormonism. But that kind of evidence survival did not happen for Christianity. There, there could have been tons of documentation, but it's all lost. So we're actually, we, we actually aren't able to look at the evidence for Christianity. So Christianity is in a different problem because the problem is not that the evidence is bad, it's that the evidence isn't there. Uh, and whereas for Mormonism, it's Except a mix. What we have. Yeah, but it's, it's terrible evidence is what I'm saying. Is that if we had more evidence for Christianity, we had more documentation, we had all the eyewitnesses, we had written writings from them, we could do a better job of figuring out what really happened. Uh, like we can for Mormonism, but we can't do that for Christianity, and that's my point. Um, so, the, so the evidential, the, there are different problems to deal with. One is the loss of evidence, one is the destruction of evidence, one is the forging of evidence. There, Christians love to invent Gospels. There are at least 40 different Gospels. Um, the Acts of John is an example. Uh, the, the way they meddled with the passage in Josephus. Um, these are the kinds of things where, where we're looking at this filter where Christians have controlled the evidence, they've destroyed the evidence, they've selected which evidence to preserve, and they've edited the evidence. Um, we don't really have that problem with a lot of religions um, that were invented since then. Uh, you could probably say maybe for like Buddhism and Taoism and Confucianism we're in similar situations where the evidence is bad because it's been policed so much by the believers that we don't have any and actual primary centuries sources. centuries in between the founder yeah, so, and what, so what so we have a, written. There's a difference Multiple between, centuries. There's a difference between having like really good evidence damning a religion like Mormonism uh, and having no evidence by which to judge what actually happened, or very little evidence to judge what happened. And so um, I would say uh, all religions are in either position. One quote from C.S. Lewis I thought of as she, uh, you asked that question that was really good. For my own part, I have sometimes told my audience that the only two things really worth considering are Christianity and Hinduism. Islam is only the greatest of Christian heresies. Buddhism only the greatest of Hindu heresies. Real paganism is, paganism is dead. All that was best in Judaism and Platonism survives in Christianity. There isn't really for an adult mind this infinite, infinite variety of religions to consider. So, 
All right. We've got about five minutes left. Dimitri, make it succinct. And let's, uh, t 10? You going to take 10? 15. Oh, 15. Oh, excuse me. All right. We're doing good. Go, Dimitri. Hi there. Uh, first of all, cheers to both of you. Fantastic Thanks. debate. Thank you so much. <laughs> now, hey there. <laughs> so this is a question primarily for Dr. Bass because I, I feel like I know Richard's answer. Um, <laughs> would, what would you say is the primary motivation for the proliferation of Christianity? Would it be providence or the conversion of a prominent Roman emperor, the Edict of Milan, etc.? And to piggyback off of that, Explain How would first you, what you mean by prol proliferation. What, what do you mean? The by that? spread of Christianity. Why did it need to spread? Right. Okay. It w was it? Or why you know, did it spread? Yeah. Was it? Why God? did it spread, or why did it need to spread? No. Why did it spread? Why was it, it spread? God, yeah. or was it the fact that it was the prevailing ruling class of the time? I see. And and secondary to that, how would you justify the um, the spirituality, the the need to believe in the one true God? with the subversion of so many pagan rituals, the Christmas tree, the Easter bunny, the December 25th. I mean, everything that is inherent in the pagan world that yeah. was subverted to to make use of <laughs> Christianity. <laughs> that's a good point. So yeah, that's okay. one big question. Well, for, first, I would, I would like to say uh, well, be. that those good questions. Uh, response to something uh, Richard said earlier, too, that yes, it's true that Post-Constantine, you do have, and I, I would say, some horrible examples of unchrist-like examples of pulling up the sword. But it's that first 280 years, this is what I'm most fascinated with, is that first 280 years from Jesus to the, the conversion of Constantine. How this group, mainly persecuted, advanced and ended up overtaking the Roman Empire. That's what's fascinating because those people did not take up the sword. In fact, they had the sword put on them. They were eaten by lions, they were crucified. Tacitus talks about this, multiple evidence. We have, it's not as uh, emphasized, you know, sometimes it's exaggerated among Christians, but it, there were sporadic persecutions for sure throughout the Roman Empire. This was not, they were not ruling in any way. And so how did they go on to overtake it? I think it shows truth to the Gamaliel statement in, Galatia, in uh, Acts 5 where he says, if this group is of God, you try to fight against it, you're going to find yourself fighting against God. And that's what ended up happening. The, one of the best books, he references it too, Rodney Stark, The Rise of Christianity, is a great book showing, and he's not really arguing for the truth of Christianity, he's just showing sociologically how did the early Christians take over pagan? How did paganism get wiped out? I mean, it, it didn't just have to be wiped out by these uh, Jews who believed that Jesus, this crucified man, was the Son of God and risen from the dead. I mean, how did paganism, I mean, the gods of Egypt, the gods of Greece, the gods of... Rome, how did they just get wiped off the face of the earth? And we laugh about them. Liam Neeson plays them in movies now. Why do, how did that happen, right? So that, looking at all that, I think we see something compelling with this movement, that it ended up overtaking the world. I forgot the second question. I got too excited about the first one. What well, was the second question again? Just well, first Oh, yeah, 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 let me, yeah, I'll, I'll respond. Yeah. So the, the, the December 25th, all that, that, that comes way later. So I would just say that has nothing to do with that first, you know, first century true you know, Orthodox Christianity. So those things just happen a lot. It, but it's, it was just, why yeah. did it need it? If it was the spirituality, the one true word, then it wouldn't have needed to support Well, well I think what they did, I, I actually do, don't have a problem with it. I think what they did with December 25th is they basically baptized a pagan holiday and made it, you know, the day that Jesus was born, even though Jesus, of course, wouldn't born that. But they were baptizing it. I have no problem with that. I think they were doing that. You know, they were just baptizing days to get people to think about Jesus rather than the pagan gods. Yeah, it's, it's a sociological strategy, though. That, that's, if you want to conquer, you actually absorb... And this is competing. when there was political and dominant. Yeah, dominant, but you, yeah. You, absorb the com you, you absorb the competition, right? That's so so yes. that's, that's just one way to actually help spread Christianity is all these people are already doing these pagan things. Let's make those pagan things Christian things, and then they'll call themselves Christians, and gosh, we win. Um, but that's, that's clearly a sociological strategy. That's not really a this is a true religion kind of strategy. It's the first 280 years, I think, is yeah, yeah, but the, the truth of it, not the post concentration. The, gr the growth of Christianity, and this is Stark himself says this, the growth of Christianity in those 280 years is exactly the same as the growth of Mormonism. So the growth rate is no more. It's not about the growth rate. I didn't say the growth no, 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 rate. No, no, the point. The point is, no, is that the growth rate. It's yeah, yeah, but that's his point. And when he says that growth rate growth was achieved, he doesn't issue. say it was achieved because the creed had good evidence. He doesn't say it was achieved even because of the creed at all. So uh, his explanations, Stark's explanations, are all sociological. He all comes up with ideas of 
church structure and moral reform. Those are the things that he credits. I think he's wrong about some of those things, but even if he's right, those are the only things that he, think cha he thinks change, that they came up with a, a moral reform movement, they came up with a better working church hierarchy in terms of how it would uh, succeed on the competing market of religions. It's entirely a sociological explanation. It has nothing to do with the creed. It has nothing to do with evidence or anything like that. Let me give you one example. I promise I'll be quick. Fascinating example. So one of the arguments he gives for why Christianity ended up dominating and, and, and multiplying versus pagans is the pagans feared death. The Christians didn't because of their belief in the resurrection. And guess what happened? The plagues happened. Multiple plagues happened in the Roman Empire. The Christians were helping the pagans. The Christians and the pagan doctors were running. They were fleeing because they didn't want to get sick and die because yeah. they had these you know, beliefs about the afterlife. So the Christians were the one helping them. They nursed them to health. They ended up becoming Christian. And this is one of the reasons. So you could look at it as a, nat a naturalistic way, but you also see the compassion and the incredible nature of these early Christians and what they did. Yeah, that, and, this is, and I think this argues for the truth. That right, illustrates right. how Stark is a good answer. Next question. Okay, we have four more questions. We're going to get these more. questions well, done. Yeah. <laughs> okay, this one goes to Richard. Um, this is in regards to the culture of the Jews before there was a falling away uh, and a uniting with Rome, with, as far as exalting pride, exalting itself in Rome. Um, as far as how the Jews' culture impacted the, uh, the disciples. So we know that all 12 disciples, ex well, except for uh, John, they all died defensively, not offensively, not, not like a lot of Muslim terrorists, but defensively in, for what they believed. And uh, they all testified that they saw these things, that they, they were there. And we have a full-blown um, creedal statement within two years, like we just talked about today. Uh, that testified that this is indeed what happened. And uh, so we have a culture of people that s were always about signs and wonders, even more than the Greeks. They wanted signs and wonders. They were always looking for signs and wonders. Jesus even rebuked them for that. And um, it was always that way, from the prophets down to Moses and even up to Adam himself. They dated the stuff that happened. It wasn't some pantheon of stuff that was just in eternity, but without grounding. Everything was dated. Everything was, you know, this happened during this person's lifetime, during this person's lifetime, and there was context given. It was rooted in history. And you have a God who is rooting himself in history through a people. And it was all about one God. It wasn't about a pantheon. So you have a very unique culture focused very concretely on one God, not a pantheon, and he's dealing with real people and real history with real consequences, real cause and effect, and all of that, mistakes made and everything. So along comes a man who allegedly... We gotta get to your question. Okay. Along comes a man who allegedly said that he was this one God, this Yahweh, and uh, he has people willing to defend, who were their witnesses. In fact, in the New Testament it says, there was 500 of them who saw Jesus ascended, and it says, weren't, weren't you guys there? You can testify to what I'm saying. I don't know the scripture, but it's there. And don't you think it's quite a conspiracy that all of this comes together within one lifetime? You just described the entire Old Testament. I don't, that's not one lifetime. Um, well, first of all, I'd recommend to everyone that you read a book called Bible Unearthed. It's a really good summary of the state of Old Testament studies now, um, and also why we're fairly certain that the Moses story is fictional, because it doesn't actually accurately describe the situation of the historical period it's set in. Um, so it's, th these are just more and more myths that they build. And the pagans were doing the same things. They were putting their gods in history and de describing their own history. The Trojan War was placed in history. You know, Hercules and these certain gods were actually placed in history. Hercules was placed in the political history of the Peloponnesus. Um, they, had, they were doing the same thing. Uh, so that, there's nothing really unique or special about that. Um, I should also point out that, that the first Christians, we, we look in the letters of Paul, for example, they were not teaching that Jesus was literally identical to God. And I know Dr. Bass disagrees with me on this. But there are many passages, I have a whole section on this in my book on the historicity of Jesus that shows passage after passage after passage and citing tons of scholarship lately on this that show that what they believed was, and Paul says this, is that Jesus was a subordinate of God, that he was the first created being, he was the firstborn of God's creation. 
And he was a subordinate. He wasn't actually coterminous with God. And later on in, in the future, after he, Jesus had accomplished all the things that God had assigned him powers to accomplish, Jesus would hand those powers back to God or merge back with God, depending on how you interpret the passage in 1 Corinthians 15. So he's not actually preaching that he's identical to God. Uh, actually, the idea of there being a supreme archangel who is the first creation, who is the image of God, who actually was tasked with the creation of the universe and is tasked with governing the universe, that wasn't actually a part of Jewish angelology. Uh, the Philo, who's one of the greatest theologians of the same time that Christianity arose, Philo is a theologian of the Jews. Uh, and he wrote on this particular figure, this archangel figure, who actually is God's first creation. He's the image of God. He created the universe and governs the universe. But he's a subordinate to God. He's an archangel. Um, and this, the Christian creed seems to be originally assuming that Jesus was this archangel. Whether Jesus existed or not, they were assuming that this was who he was, that he had descended from outer space as this archangel became incarnate, did his ministry or whatever, depending on what you believe, and then died and resurrected and returned to his role, and God extra exalted him for this, this role. This is how Christianity actually began. The idea of him becoming identical to God came later. Um, and with the beginning of that, I'll just, since there's so many other points I couldn't address in there, but the beginning of that was the notion of the 12 apostles all testifying. We don't have any of their testimonies. Um, so we don't know what they were testifying to. We don't know what they claim to have seen. We don't know what their actual original, what the reasons for believing what they did were, because uh, we don't have it from them. And we don't even have it from Paul. All, all Paul talks about are revelations and scriptures. He doesn't have any knowledge of any other kinds of, uh, of information. So, and we also don't know, we don't have any good evidence as to why they died, when they died. Some of them we have maybe some evidence that they were killed, but we don't know what for, and we don't know that recanting would have saved them. Again, I mentioned that earlier. So um, there isn't much we can do with that information. I'll just be brief. You know, Paul definitely believed Jesus was Yahweh in the flesh, and we could get into that if we want to, but yes, Paul believed he was God, and he says that in multiple places, and that, that's, that's a pretty, pretty unanimous uh, testimony. What Richard is referring really? to is the fact that there is, that's true that there are two persons, that, that the Father is not the Son, and the Son is not the Father. That is the distinguishing fac uh, factor he's talking about. But that the fact that Jesus is one with the true God, that he is God, uh, Paul definitely makes that clear by specifically calling him Yahweh. He is the Yahweh, uh, no. the God of the Old Testament. Paul never calls him Yahweh. He says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Lord is a generic term. Every, is even what's even your boss. There? What's he quoting there? It doesn't matter what he's what's, quoting. No, it is it's, matter what matters is what he's interpreting it no, as. No, he's quoting Joel 2, which is Yahweh. In the which could text. be interpreted different ways by different Jewish sects. Interpreted different ways, it's Yahweh. No, no, Lord is a generic term. Lord could, is not a generic term. Even Curiosity angels, is the translation of Yahweh no, no, no. Right, 7,000 times in the Old Testament. All right, gentlemen. Okay. Uh, even, three more even questions. The but, but, but one thing I didn't get to respond to, just I want to say he mentioned the Bible under earth to challenge the history of Moses. Kenneth Kitchen, who was an Egyptologist, uh, wrote The Reliability of the Old Testament, which challenges exactly that book. So okay. keep that in mind. Um, so uh, the Gospels were written during a very politically and socially tumultuous time where you had efforts to slaughter entire movements because of their beliefs. And uh, Dr. Bass, I was wondering if you think uh, maybe the writers of the Gospels in committing stories like the resurrection uh, to writing might have tailored them in some ways to be less offensive to the authorities of the time uh, just for the sake of keeping the movement alive. And uh, if so, uh, how you as a believer and also as a historian using those stories as evidence uh, would take that into account. Okay, I'm not, I don't know if I'm fully understanding, but uh, I would say that the, the things that they're, they're saying is very anti the government in a lot of ways because they're proclaiming Jesus as kind of, you know, a new king. And to argue for a king in the Roman Empire is to say someone is king other than Caesar. And this is exactly what Paul got into trouble with in Acts 17, because they said they, they, uh, his enemies accused him of, he's, he's preaching a king, one called Jesus, another king, one called Jesus, basically, other than Caesar. And so to, to proclaim Jesus as a king versus Caesar, I think this is one of the reasons why he got crucified with Pilate. Pilate could care less that Jesus claimed to be God. That's what the Jews cared about. But they, he did care that he claimed to be a king. And that's why it said king of the Jews above him on the cross. And that was the inscription. That was the charge that ultimately put him to death. You know, he was, he was uh, crucified as a messianic pretender, just like these other uh, guys. Um, so I, I would say that what they were saying in those gospels were very, in a sense, I mean, the, clo the, the best you get for the government is give to Caesar what is Caesar's. But ultimately, the proclamation about Jesus are, is, is kind of a treasonous statement to the Roman government. 
I think the Book of Acts gets this right in terms of the general, the generic political reality of it. it. And you see that the trial with the last trial of Paul in the Book of Acts, the Romans actually didn't care because Jesus was dead. Um, so worshiping a, a dead guy, worshiping a, a, a celestial being at this point as your Lord, um, tons of people did that. Uh, so uh, that actually wasn't a threat to the government. It would be a threat to the government if he was still alive walking around and giving orders and claiming to be king. Uh, but the, the, they sh the Acts shows the Romans consistently, time after time, saying, I, I don't see why there's anything wrong with this sect. You're not, you're not doing those things. So um, now you could say Acts is lying, that it, it's covering up, it's whitewashing what the Romans actually said and did in these trials. But, uh, no, we agree. Acts is historical. We finally agree. <laughs> <laughs> but if it is correctly reflecting the way that Romans were reacting to early Christianity, they weren't regarding it as treasonous in that sense. Now, what they did eventually regard it as treasonous as is that they were, they were engaging in public assembly without a license. Um, now, we take that for granted today in the United States. We have uh, the right to assembly is written into the Constitution. That's actually radical and rare. It was like one of the first times in history that the people got the right to assemble. Before that, it was the government's always got to choose whether you could assemble or not, and you had, usually had to get licenses. In the Roman Empire, you had to get a license to assemble. Otherwise, it was regarded as subversive. If you're assembling, it's a threat to us. We don't care what you're talking about. Um, and so the Christians were often persecuted, and we have that example. The, the only case we have of an actual Christian author describing why he's persecuting Christians is Pliny the Younger. Uh, and he didn't like it. He didn't think he should have to do it. He thought these, it, was, it was pointless. But they were assembling without a license, and he had to enforce the law. And that was, that was it. And he didn't think there was anything really wrong with what they were teaching. He even says, like, it was, it's a silly superstition, but it's totally innocuous. Um, he does say they were proclaiming Christ as a god. Yeah, yeah, but he didn't say that was actually a problem. Uh, the problem was the illegal right. assembly yeah, aspect of it. But, but it's a uh, testimony that so, they were worshiping Jesus as God. So, yeah, so I don't, I don't see the Gospels as being a problem. I think the most subversive document in the New Testament politically is the book of Revelation. Yeah. True. Go ahead, Vesna. Yes. Um, Vesna from Madison. Dr. Bess, I would really like to know how the writer of Mark was able to report on that conversation that the two women didn't tell anybody about. You referring at the to, empty tomb. I think you're he, referring to at the, at the empty tomb. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So uh, this gets into uh, he mentioned that too, but this gets into your view of the longer ending of Mark. And so my view of the longer ending of Mark is that there was more than just verse eight, and what we have basically in Matthew. Is that because if you if you watch Matthew, Matthew is definitely using Mark just like Luke is using Mark, and Matthew is following Mark very closely. We see Matthean uh, things that he's adding and doing different things throughout. But ultimately, when you get to verse eight in Matthew twenty-eight eight, in parallel with that, it talks about the women, the same basically statement, the same exact statement, and then the very next thing is Jesus appears to the women in Matthew, and then we have other things. And so I think Matthew gives us whatever Mark originally wrote. Now, why it got lost, there's so many different theories on that, but I think the longer ending of Mark, this is N.T. Wright's view and many others, but, but the longer ending of Mark, I think ultimately was lost, but we have it in Matthew. We have it basically with Matthean uh, edition. So I think the women, of course, got the message from Jesus to go and tell the disciples, just like um, uh, it says in Matthew, and so therefore Peter would have, of course, told Mark. And, but, but Mark said, that's yeah. because it ends he's, at verse 8, though. He, he's, he's speculating that there was a, an ending of Mark that's been lost. Yes. Uh, and there's a variety of possible endings of Mark that could have been lost. I don't think, and there are scholars who don't think that's the case, too. So there's, there's debate in this. But there's there's, debate. there's no way to prove one way or another. Um, there's a variety of different possibilities, uh, some of which... It's almost certain the women end up telling people. Well, yeah, I mean, you could, that if you believe that that really happened, you can infer that, I suppose. But uh, I think Mark is putting that in there specifically for the purpose of saying that... that that this wasn't something that is historical, that it's actually, this is an allegorical thing. And you should not do as the women do, that you should do, you should preach, uh, you should proclaim uh, the truth of it, rather than acting in fear like they did. I think that's the whole literary point of the story. But there's many ways you could debate as to the point of the story and what possible endings may have existed and been lost and stuff. And some of them are interesting, but uh, there's not much you can do with that evidence-wise. All right, last question. Your question. I'm Christina Zawodiewski. I'm a poet and um, artist. And I used to do a television series here in Milwaukee called Where the Waters Meet. So if you want to arouse the interest of a crowd, talk about sex or death. So I wanted to know if you chose this question for debate because the resurrection is a symbol of our defiance of death, 
because so many people are afraid of death? Or why did you choose this topic? Yeah. Uh, I don't yeah, we, we, we remember went back and forth on. The, yeah, that's we true. We went back and forth on the topic. I, I mean, I, I don't. We remember. wanted to do something with the resurrections. So. Yeah, it was it was kind of organically decided upon. It wasn't based on that kind of reasoning. But no. uh, the um, I mean, w one thing that I was interested in doing is is the debate that William Lane Craig refused to have with me. Um, when I debated him, I asked, "You can't debate the resurrection until you've debated the sources. We got to debate the reliability of the sources first. So I want to do that debate. Uh, are, are the sources reliable? Basically, I wanted to do this debate with William Lane Craig, and he refused. And just so you know, my, my first response when they asked me to do this, I wanted to debate: Did Jesus exist? Because kids, you can't talk about the resurrection <laughs> until you get the existence of Jesus. So we're going to have to do that one next. Yeah, yeah. But I can admit I could be wrong about the historicity of Jesus, and we could still have this debate. Though. So that's, that's and that's why I think we ended up on this. All right, Sean's going to take organizer's privilege and get one last question. Right. Oh, organizer's privilege, Sorry, Sean, make it a good one. And I will say it was a challenge just to get the terminology of this debate. That's why the long title, <laughs> debate of its own. not of with the us, marketing nightmare that? Yeah, yeah, with right, this so, one. Is it so long? Right, yeah, right. <laughs> so really, I just I want to thank everyone again. First debate of its kind in Milwaukee. So give yourselves a round of applause for being so brave and coming here and doing this. And thank you so much to Miguel and Justin and Richard and the team. We're gonna pull the team up after my, my question here. So I am taking organizer rights here, I'm gonna ask one. <laughs> but thank you again, everyone, so much. Thank you to Shane Hall and the Wade staff. Thank you to everyone involved and uh, Peter Isley. I don't know if we're gonna get some comments on that online. I'd love to see how people are gonna respond to that. Great job on that question. Hmm. Dr. Bass. So today we talked about concepts. We talked about the resurrection. And you talked about how Christianity is the offshoot of Judaism. Uh, Christianity is unique. I'd say it's the fulfillment of Judaism. But fulfillment of Judaism. Unique, uh, Judaism is unique because there's one God, one devil, the monotheist model. Yeah. Prior to Persian Zoroastrianism, Judaism didn't have these concepts. So how is it that Christianity is the one unique religion and they're taking from an ancient Persian model in Christianity? Uh, I would challenge that. And uh, the, the, the writer of uh, John Collins, who uh, did the com really the definitive commentary on the book of Daniel, he discusses this, and it's in the Hermeneus series, the most critical scholarly uh, commentary series, and he makes clear that this idea that the Persian motifs that Christianity borrowed from, or Judaism borrowed from that, has been long, you know, refuted. And so the, the, the ideas, many things that people thought they got from the Persian, we can find in like Isaiah, or we can find in Hosea, we can find in the Psalms, we can find in places within the Old Testament. So I would say those sources that people, some people point to as Persian uh, goes back to that. And, and really, if, if, again, this, this goes back to the evidence. You know, let's look at the evidence of Zoroastrianism. I mean, we don't have any writings for that for like, I don't think even post-Christianity. I mean, do we have anything written about Zoroastrianism before Christianity? We do, yeah. We do? What? Yeah, yeah. We have some stuff. We have like oral nothing. I don't think we have anything. No, no, no. no, no, no we, I, the, we, the we, have, we have Greek, we have pre-Christian Greek accounts of many of the beliefs of the Zoroastrians, including the general resurrection at the end times. No, but we, we don't have any actual Zoroastrian writings, though. Uh, no, the, the writings that's of the Zoroastrians that's what I meant. themselves. That's what I meant. Yeah, yeah. yeah sorry. Right. So the Avesta, for example. So these it's things all don't. Post. Yeah, this doesn't happen until you know hundreds of years. So yes, we can. We got a little bit from Greek writers, but I mean, goodness gracious! I mean, and it's hundreds of years. I mean, Zoroaster, when did he live? I mean, the debates is like a thousand BC, five hundred BC, seven fifty BC. I mean, this is nothing like the First Corinthians fifteen with two years after the death of Jesus. I mean, this is an incredible incredible thing when you compare it, especially with other religions in the ancient world. But I, I just will add to that, Judaism, and if you read the Old Testament, you can make the argument, a really good argument, that it's poly polytheistic. They're talking about God of God, Lord of Lords, Yahweh is the Lord of many lords. And they also talk about Bel and, all, uh, and yeah. El and all of these other Te uh, Babylonian yeah. gods in the Old Testament. Technically, that's henotheism. So, so, and I do agree that there is this it is very possible that people in the Old Testament yeah. did believe that there were other gods, but that Yahweh is the ultimate God, the God of all the gods. But we do have good evidence from some that say, like Jeremiah and certain places, they'll say, they're just idols. They don't really exist. So I do think that we've had that too. So 
but yeah, there's no doubt that they're saying one God is the God of all. So, great question. All right, that concludes the debut of Buzz Belief. <clears throat> Mario, you hit a home run. Thank you, and thank you to your family. Say hi to Mario. He's the guy who's all beat up. You can't miss him. Get a drink, mingle with the guests, and thank you again for coming. I'd like to also thank Miguel Connor for moderating this event. Thank you so much for coming down and making this a, a great conversation.